Good afternoon, one and all. Welcome to the post lunch session. For the next session, I'll be calling upon Dr. Benjita Pinto, consultant hematologist Manipal, and Dr. Satyaprata Gambuli, emeritus professor, Apollo Clinics Hospital, Kolkata. Department of Medicine and he will talk on <coughs> Jogren syndrome. For the last year there are many developments in Jogren syndrome. It is now not a glandular disease. The extra glandular features are coming and we are diagnosing and treating. So over to you Shankar. So 
So uh, this is one of the most modern uh, study that, that has been published recently. They, here they have tried to study the role of TNF alpha in the uh, pathogenesis of Jogas. Uh, as you can, what they have done first is that they have uh, studied the uh, uh, expression of TNF alpha in the north, uh, salivary glands of the Jogas uh, patients. So as you can see, this is a normal salivary gland and this is the TNF uh, immunostatiosity. Compared to the inflamed, uh, compared to the normal gland, the inflamed salivary gland had uh, significantly increased expression of TNF alpha. So now that they have shown that TNF alpha has increased the expression in salivary glands, now they have uh, developed a mouse model, uh, which, where they have used the aquaporin 5 uh, CRE transgene, uh, which will have an uh, uh, which will uh, in, uh, this particular uh, uh, genetic mice will have increased uh, expression of aquaporin 5. And this has been trans uh, bred with the transgenic mice which contains the uh, TNF alpha. <coughs> so this will lead on to uh, where the aquaporin CRE gene is uh, incorporated in front of the uh, TNF alpha gene. So there will be increased production of uh, overexpression of TNF alpha specifically. So when we compare the biopsies from the uh, uh, submandibular gland and the lacrimal glands from these uh, transgenic mice, as you can see, compared to the TNF uh, alpha alone expressing mice, the uh, aquaporin 5 CRE and the TNF alpha uh, of the exocrine glands of these forms. So they have also shown that the mRNA levels are also increased in this uh, transgenic mice and also the downstream part, uh, molecules, the nf kappa b and the phosphorylated nf kappa b also significantly uh, in this uh, model. So then what they have seen is that uh, the on uh, follow-up, the, these models have started to uh, uh, show that uh, there is a decreased expression of the aquaporin 5 in the SNR cells. And also there is increased uh, apoptosis as uh, indicated by the expression of their talent. And also there is a decreased stimulation of salivary production with biocarbon. So what this model has shown that is uh, there is overexpression of TNF alpha uh, and this causes uh, inflammation in the SNR cell atrophy in the salivary glands. So this is another model which has helped in studying the effect of the uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress. As we know, there are misfolded, unfolded proteins are uh, uh, inflammatory in uh, nature. Uh, this we have studied uh, in the SPI group, but here in this model, they have tried to study the effect of unfolded proteins in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress in the uh, So, in this MOS model, they have tried to uh, see the effect of cathepsin inhibitors. Uh, so, this will have a therapeutic uh, indication. So, cathepsin uh, S inhibitor has been injected intraperitoneally and topically into the uh, eyes of the uh, mouse model, which are predisposed to develop tokens. And as we can see here, when the cathepsin S inhibitor was given intraperitoneally, there is a decreased uh, uh, cathepsin S activity in the tears, in the uh, lacrimal gland uh, lysis, and also the splenic lysis. While when it was given in the topical preparation, there is uh, effect only on the tear, uh, tears and not in the splenic lysis. So probably uh, cathepsin S inhibitors may be uh, a therapeutic target in future to uh, improve the ocular manifestations in this patients. Uh, so next, coming to the genetics and epigenetics, uh, there is a lot of studies which have been conducted previously, and in this diagram, the inner circle is uh, related to the Schwarzenegger syndrome and as you can see the, the green marks, these are the genes which are so strongly associated with the development of Schwarzenegger syndrome. The same genes have been uh, given in this paper. So this is what is already known. So <coughs> recently there is a genome-wide association study which has been uh, published. Uh, here they have documented that apart from these uh, 10 genes which are already known, there are certain novel uh, gene markers which are uh, predisposed to uh, develop uh, syndrome. These are marked in the red and, and they have also shown that HLA is the one of the strongest uh, uh, genetic marker for development of uh, and with an odds ratio of uh, ranging up to 20 uh, percent So next coming to the epigenetic studies, epigenetics is a process uh, which alters the gene activity without changing the DNA sequence. So there are various methods in which epigenetic modification can happen. Uh, most important is the methylation and demethylation. So this will uh, uh, result in a different expression of the uh, gene. 
and there are also chromatin modification which results in various micro RNAs, molecular pairing RNAs, and uh, long non coding RNAs, etc. So, coming to the epigenetic data in journals, uh, there is a uh, uh, terminology called the epigenetic wide association studies, similar to the GMO studies that we know. Here they have studied uh, the methylation uh, modifications from uh, in the entire chromosome. So from th these are known as telomere to telomere methylation studies. And uh, when there is a hypomethylation, the, uh, usually what happens is when there is a hypomethylation, the particular uh, gene will be hyperexpressed. And when there is a hypermethylation, it will be suppressed for most of the days. So what they have seen in Jordan's patients is that there is hypomethylation of the interferon inducible genes. Uh, and we already know that interferon is one of the main uh, uh, molecule which uh, mediates explanation in these patients. And also there is hypermethylation of the POX P3 which is the master regulator of the deregulated cells. So these are, the, because of these changes in methylation, uh, there will be a shift towards the pro-inflammatory uh, cascade in this patient. So apart from this, there are various, these are the various uh, epigenetic uh, studies that have been done. Most of them have shown association with various uh, pathogenic pathways. And the certain circular RNAs have also been uh, studied in relation to the various clinical manifestations. And then, uh, recently there is an attempt to link the genetic variation with the epigenetic modification. So this is, uh, uh, this is called as a methylation quantitative uh, trait locale okay, where there will be allelic asymmetry in DNA methylation along with the uh, single nucleotide poly polymorphism present in these elements. So they have done an analysis of all the published data and they have identified that uh, there is a strong association between the genetic risk and the DNA methylation in genes which are related to the pro-inflammatory cytokine pathways in patients with children. So, uh, but this is a very uh, preliminary raw data for the studies need to be done in this uh, area to actually understand what exactly is the correlation between the genetic markers and the epigenetic markers. So the other area where there is a lot of uh, research going on is the microbiome uh, in, as it was true for all the other autoimmune rheumatic diseases. Uh, so in this study, Wang et al. have tried to analyze the microbiome uh, differences in the uh, gut microbia, oral microbiota and the vaginal microbiota. So what they have done is they have taken healthy controls, they have taken uh, patients of Sika who are not uh, primary locals. And they have taken one that is the primary children patients who are not on HCQS and also they have taken patients who are already on HCQS for 6 months and HCQS for 12 months at least. So from this uh, cohort what they have seen is that there is significant uh, differences in the uh, microbiota which compared to the healthy controls and the most uh, significant variation is seen in the oral microbiota. And uh, when, we see, when they have seen the ratio of the permicutis to the bacteroides, there is a significant difference between the healthy controls to the primary organs and also primary organs versus the non-primary organs in the So this uh, shows that there is a significant uh, role of the uh, microbiota dysbiosis in patients with uh, primary organs. So when they have analyzed the uh, differences between patients who are not received hydroxychloroquine versus those who are on hydroxychloroquine, uh, usage of hydroxychloroquine has partially uh, uh, reduce this uh, dysbiosis. However, it was not a, a complete uh, normalization of the uh, microbia. So probably hydroxychloroquine might uh, have a role in the uh, modification of the disease process. So this is a summary of this uh, study. And uh, there was another study on uh, oral microbiota in tokens. Uh, here the authors have studied the 16S RNA gene sequencing from the oral secretions and they have seen that Compared to the healthy controls, the Jokers patients had a significantly different uh, microbiota. And they have gone a step ahead and they have pro-cultured the salivary gland epithelial cells with the various microbial bacterial species that have been identified in the presence of interferon gamma. So what they have seen is that the uh, Privotella melatonogenesis, this is the one organism which had uh, significantly uh, made a difference in the MHC1, MHC2 and the CD8 expression in uh, the salivary gland epithelial cells indicating that this uh, organism might have a significant role in the pathogenesis of uh, bacteria. <coughs> so next coming to the various cytokines and the immune cells, uh, uh, we all know that the uh, is driven by type 1 interferon genes. 
Uh, in this study, they have tried to see the relation how this uh, trypanendocrinols are actually working. Okay. So they have studied the role of inflammasome mediated pyroptosis. So caspase 1 and uh, gas determine D are the markers for the inflammasome uh, mediated pyroptosis. And when they have correlated the gene expression between the uh, type 1 endocrinols and these uh, uh, pyroptosis genes, there is a significantly strong correlation between these two uh, genes. And also the on stimulation of uh, salivary gland epithelial cells with type 1 endocrinol, there is increased expression of the gas phase 1 and the gas phase 2 indicating that uh, interferon, uh, one, uh, type 1 interferons act by, uh, this is one of the mechanism by which type 1 interferons uh, uh, act in these patients. So the, coming to the role of salivary gland epithelial cells, uh, uh, IL-17 has been shown to be mediating the epithelial mesenchymal uh, transition in the salivary gland epithelial cells. And further they have studied both the canonical and the non-canonical pathways and shown that the uh, TGF beta 1 smad uh, pathway and the ERK12 gene expression are involved in the RL7 mediated uh, expression. And in another study, they have shown that the progenitor uh, cell uh, uh, niches have been significantly decreased in amounts because there is early senescence in this uh, uh, progenitor cell niches, uh, which might be the, one of the early features of primary organs. Probably that is the reason why they might not have response in future with immunosuppression. So regarding the apparent B cell activation, uh, uh, B cell and uh, tor like receptor signaling has been studied. Uh, EPSP1 expression has been uh, shown to promote the TLR9 signaling leading to activation of the B cells. And also they have identified a subset of memory cells, those are the FCRL4 positive uh, memory cells. And they have shown that the chronically activated uh, this subset of memory cells can cause epithelial damage and uh, in future lead on to lymphoma uh, production. And similarly, the role of T cells have also been uh, studied, and the two new subsets of T cells have been uh, studied in uh, donors. One is the T follicular helper, T helper cells and uh, uh, peripheral T helper T cells. These have uh, been correlated uh, uh, with the presence of the ectopic lymphoid structures and the uh, uh, presence of high IgG and low C1 in these uh, uh, patients. So based on this molecular uh, signatures, various clusters have been developed uh, to understand whether the, uh, there are any uniform group of patients in the primary organs which can have a different potential uh, response to the therapy. Uh, this is one study where they have divided these patients into two clusters based on the uh, grade of inflammatory state. And they have shown that cluster 2 has a low grade of inflammatory state and they had a better response to the treatment compared to the cluster 1. Similarly, another study has tried to cluster them according to the interferon uh, expression and the various other inflammatory module expression. So they have identified three different clusters. And uh, based on the genomic, epigenetic and the transcriptomic data, they have, uh, so right now have classified them into four clusters uh, with different uh, pathogenic uh, markers. However, these are all in the very initial stage and whether the, these clusters have any clinical uh, relevance towards uh, for the studies are needed to understand that. And the most uh, hot topic in Jordan's is the imaging of the salivary glands. So, as we know, ultrasound is, uh, is, most of the, is coming into most of the uh, management of most of the rheumatic diseases. Salivary gland ultrasound is a very easy and non invasive technique, and uh, including ultrasound scores in, within the classification have shown that the sensitivity has increased from 90% to almost 96%. And the initial scoring was proposed in 1992. However, recently in 2019, OMARAC working group had proposed the terminology and the grading, four grade uh, scoring for ultrasound. Uh, I'll be showing pictures of this. Uh, so, this is a grade 0, which is a normal looking paratrypon. This is a homogeneous paratrypon. In grade 1, there is some inhomogeneity. However, we cannot identify hypoechoic or anechoic areas. In grade 2, there is uh, some uh, hypoechoic and anechoic areas with preserved normal paracrema. And in grade 3, the entire paracrema is replaced by uh, the hypoechoic area. And the new technique in ultrasound is the shear wave elastography. Uh, uh, here, it measures the stiffness of the gland, and this indicates the, whether, the gland, whether there is any development of malignant areas. So there are two studies which have used this technique and in one study they have uh, uh, done an ROC curve to determine the uh, elasticity of the cutoffs further. 
uh, and they have come, uh, come out with a risk across for the uh, submandibular and parotid gland. And when they have uh, studied the diagnostic performance in these two techniques, uh, for the parotid gland, including the shear wave elastography, it increased the sensitivity and specificity of the, the diagnosis. And in another study, they have given the cutoffs for the diagnosis, uh, use of uh, shear, shear wave elastography. Cutoff of more than 6.5 kilopascals is highly specific for uh, primary locus, and cutoff of more than 11.2 kilopascals is highly suspicious for lymphoma. And uh, uh, with your name, PET CT had been studied uh, along with MRI. Uh, so salivary glands and the other uh, exocrine glands have shown that the uh, uh, with your name, PET uh, SUV uptake are much lesser than patients with locus compared to healthy control. And in the MRI, uh, volume has not been different, but the fraction has uh, uh, significantly high in pressure with shoulders. So coming to the last topic that is treatment modalities. Uh, Inalumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against BARP receptor, has been studied in the 2 b trial, which has been recently published in Lancet. So uh, their primary objective is the dose-dependent uh, response in ESHI and uh, they have seen that the response with uh, 300 milligrams is much higher compared to the other doses. And this is the graph showing the individual uh, responses with individual doses. Uh, based on this, uh, another uh, phase 3 plan is uh, uh, started. And uh, this is the beta set which has not shown to be positive, uh, not shown any positive results in primary programs. And uh, tocilizumab again failing to show any positive results in uh, these patients. And uh, various uh, animal models have sh shown the use of JAK inhibitors. However, the human uh, studies are not much available, but uh, uh, there are three ongoing trials in uh, JAK inhibitors. So these are the various uh, other newer therapeutic uh, targets that has inhibitors, uh, fruta, DTK inhibitors, and the uh, mRNA inhibitors. These are all under uh, experimental uh, uh, studies. So, to so summarize the exact pathogenic mechanism in Jorgens, uh, still needs to be studied in detail. And microbiome dysbiosis may be contributing to this immune dysregulation. Salivary gland ultrasound is a very easy and non invasive method to assess salivary glands in this patient. And uh, even though there is no proven efficacious immunosuppression, still the search for the contact is ongoing. Thank you. I want to impress that spectrum of Jokerian disease has increased. Yes. Because I have seen at least five or six cases where the glandular symptoms are almost absent. Came with quite depressies, sensory ataxia. So everybody should remember this. Thank you again. You just uh, wait and there may be a question. Now over to my co chair. Uh, Associate Professor. Uh uh, clinical immunology, uh, Jitma Puducha. Of treatment studies and uh, mortality, there is the heart and the coming lupus. As I said, pathophysiology dealing with lupus infects. Uh, this group, uh, which published their paper in June 2022, looked at CD33 and how it impacts mitochondrial fitness in lupus. I'm sorry, CD38. So, what we have to know is CD38 is an ectonucleotidase and it uh, uh, cleaves NADP uh, and thus is part of the energy synthesis in the mitochondria as well as uh, production of reactive oxygen free radicals. So we know that reactive free oxygen free, free radicals are important in fighting against infections. So what they did is they extracted CD8 T lymphocytes from lupus patients and used uh, BDX2 mines model uh, as a surrogate for lupus. So when they looked at the CD8 T cells, what they found is uh, individuals who, who had lower expression of CD38 had a higher metabolic activity and those who had lower expression of CD38 had a lower metabolic activity. When they looked at their uh, mitochondria under the electron microscope, what they found is those with high CD8 had lesser cristae in the mitochondria and we know that cristae is a, a place where most of the metabolic activity in the mitochondria takes place. So they had lesser cristae whereas the CD38 low had higher number of cristae in the mitochondria which corroborates with the metabolic activity. Further on they went on and uh, they infected the BDX2 mouse model. Just an overview of what this BDX2 mouse model is, it is a spontaneously developing autoimmune model 
the young BDX2 usually does not have any autoimmunity, and as the mouse becomes older, it be it has a lot of autoimmunity, and it uh, also develops CD8 T cells, which are CD38 positive. So when they gave LCMV virus, they found that the viral load in the BDX2 adult mouse was the highest, and uh, it also showed that these uh, virus had a lot of hepatitis features uh, when given LCMV virus. So overall what they found is CD38, high CD8 T cells, they are functionally and morphologically defective mitochondria. And this dysfunctional CD8 T cells in the BTX2 lupus prone mouse at least causes increased viral hepatitis after infection with LCMV virus. And CD, later on, later they went on to inhibit the CD8, CD38 and this caused a uh, reversal of the mitochondrial defect and also restored the uh, hepatitis and cleared the LCMV much uh, efficiently. So to summarize what they found is CD38 high will uh, is detrimental to uh, mitochondrial health and mitophagy and which predisposes to increased infection. Though they have lowered it in viral infection, I think there should be studies that look into bacterial infections as well. So going into uh, infection in lupus, we have found that uh, you know it's always a clinical uh, confusion where a patient comes, patient of lupus comes to us with fever, and we are unsure if it is disease activity or if it is fe uh, infection. So for that, uh, we have this multi-institutional cohort uh, which validated 168 febrile episodes in lupus patients, out of which uh, 33 patients were bacterial infections. And we found that simple markers like total lymphocyte count, total leukocyte count, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, uh, CRP levels, and procalcitonin were higher in the infection subgroup. And we did a regression analysis, and we found that uh, patients, uh, by using just total lymphocyte, uh, total leukocyte count, uh, age, and CRP, we had an AUC of almost 88, which is a very good predictor of uh, infection in a existing patient of lupus and th there is a calculator that is available for uh, use uh, wherein it will give you the probability of infection in a patient with lupus with fever which has very simple things like age, probability lymphocyte count and CRP. Going ahead with biomarker studies, lupus nephritis is another challenge in lupus. Uh, it is challenging because first of all we don't know at the start of lupus nephritis if they are going to progress to first stage renal disease and uh, do we do a biopsy at every flare and what is the use of it and then we rely heavily on histopathology to escalate immunosuppression and to uh, modify drugs. So this was a multi-center study that was uh, spearheaded by Professor Rowell and was uh, published in 2020 in February. They had 120 patients it was, uh, the, it was the study had two factors, the cross-sectional component as well as the longitudinal component. So in the cross-sectional component, what they saw is, they measured urinary <coughs> endothelial growth factor uh, levels. And what they found is, first of all, when compared to healthy controls, lupus nephritis, uh, patients without lupus nephritis, SLD without lupus nephritis, had similar levels of urinary EGFR to creatinine ratio. But then, if this patient, if a lupus patient had ever had lupus nephritis, they had significantly lower levels of urinary EGF levels. And then with every flare, what they found is the urinary EGF levels fell. So, this, this almost reflected what was happening in the kidney. Going ahead, we, we know about this activity and chronicity scores that are usually reported by pathologists in our kidney biopsies. They did a correlation of uh, urinary EGF levels with uh, the activity score and they found there were absolutely no correlation. But with chronicity score when they saw, there was significant negative correlation. That is the higher the chronicity uh, score, the lower the urinary EGF to creatinine ratio was. Then they tried to identify cutoffs which would say that these patients would end up worsening or this patients would end up worsening in their creatinine. So they found that a cutoff of 5 or below. Uh, so in these patients, uh, what happened is they eventually progressed to uh, end stage renal disease and with every flare their uh, EGF, uh, EGF levels also fell. 
So the take home message from the study was that urinary EGF are lower in lupus nephritis for sure as compared to normal uh, SLE. Their fall in urinary EGF levels adequately reflects fall in e EGFR and urinary EGF reflects the histopathological damage and may be a good prognostic indicator to suggest that they go on to develop end stage renal disease. So the clinical implication is we can start, if we want to start using it, we can start using it to prognosticate patients. We can see if the damage is progressing as a you know as we measure C3, C4, and DS DNA. We could also this could also be a parameter to measure on periodic visits. And finally, to detect the cause of renal impairment, is it flare or just accumulating damage? Could be clearer with, by using this non uh, non interventional method. Coming to uh, treatment, uh, drug withdrawal in lupus is always tricky and the people have tried to uh, solve this in many ways and uh, this is a study that was published in June 22 where uh, patients with lupus nephritis who were uh, biopsy proven underwent randomization and 48 of them were allocated to drug continuation and 48 were allocated to drug discontinuation. Their two year outcome was analyzed. So what they found is that relapse of proliferative lupus nephritis was only 12% if the immunosuppression therapy was continued but it was 27% if, if it was discontinued. And this said that you know, withdrawing immunosuppression is actually inferior to continuing immunosuppression over a period of 2 years in lupus nephritis. But the time to relapse was similar, not that you have withdrawn the drug that the patient has flared early. And uh, severe flares were also less. Uh, if you take overall flare rate, not just the uh, renal flare, even that was less in immunosuppression continuation arm as compared to immunosuppression withdrawal arm. But these, uh, the same group also saw for a cost factor in the whole uh, project and they found that by withdrawing immunosuppression, even though they had extra flares, they were saving almost 40% of the actual money spent by these patients. So that could be a relevant uh, outcome if the flares are not really severe. Then they went on to look at predictors of flare. This is what we are interested in. They found that a younger age group had more flare. If the estimated GFR was normal, that means they had not gone into a chronic kidney disease, they had more flare. The urine PCR of 0.5, which, which is very questionable because we already know 0.5 and above, we, we consider it as activity and we go ahead and do a biopsy. So these patients had higher flare. If lymphocyte count was lower, they had a higher flare. And if there was any serological activity, they had higher flare. What this whole study means to say is, if there is any form of activity, you know, these patients are going to flare if you withdraw drugs. So to solve this, we, we have uh, presented our data in ACR uh, this year. We have an interim analysis of a, a randomized uh, non-inferiority trial where we have randomized 59 patients uh, into uh, withdrawal, uh, withdrawal uh, and 62 patients into uh, immunosuppression withdrawal. Uh. So what we did is, we, for one arm we withdrew steroids, the other arm we withdrew uh, immunosuppression by keeping steroids intact. So on a mean follow-up of 39 weeks, we found there were 23 flares and 15 out of which were in the immunosuppression with uh, steroid withdrawal group, but 8 patients were in the immunosuppression withdrawal group. So by the end of 39 weeks, we found that 51, 51 patients still remained in uh, uh, flare-free uh, phase in the immunosuppression withdrawal group, whereas 43 patients stayed in the uh, remission phase in the uh, prednisolone withdrawal group. So this was not statistically significant, but we have the data that is coming out of the full trial. It is one year outcome. So uh, I would like to share it. Uh, later so this was another poster that was presented in ACR which was look, which looked at tapering corticosteroids. So by now we know that if any disease is active, any form of disease activity is there, then mostly the patients are going to flare. So what they did is, this was done by the APLA group, uh, what they did is they took patients who are in remission, they classified them into no disease activity, clinical remission and complete remission and then they subjected them either to continue therapy or to taper therapy. So they had about out of 3,002 patients, uh, almost 40,808 clinical visits with in remission was identified 
and they out of which 20 20 or uh, percent underwent drug, drug withdrawal. It is not clear what they withdrew, was it the immunosuppressive agent or the steroid or both, but yeah, what they found is only those who were in complete remission, which is which is defined by the Doris as sled I 2K of less than zero. Uh, physician assessment, physician, physician global assessment of 0.5 and prednisone dose less than 5. These are the ones who are less likely to flare on a uh, two year uh, basis. So, to summarize the withdrawal strategy, what we can take from all the three studies is withdrawing immunosuppression in lupus has more flares, but mostly they are minor. And attempt only in complete remission patients, that is, those who are clinically and serologically quiescent. Very slow taper may be an alternative. This was shown in a paper uh, by Daphne Gladman et al. in the uh, previous year uh, that they tapered steroids over 17 months and these patients likely stayed in remission for longer. And steroid versus immunosuppression debate is always there. Finally, two newer drugs uh, which I thought could uh, be uh, would come to clinical practice soon. One is the CD19 CAR T cell. Uh, which depleted the B cells, and the next one was the B cell depletion by obinutizumab. Uh, first, the CAR T cell, this was like a case series. They took five patients with very active lupus disease, uh, with the uh, average sled of 12 and above, and they administered CAR T cells uh, against the CD19, and they found that at three, three months itself, proteinuria had normalized, and these were refractory patients. So. They, they had already tried MMF and such was mild. And uh, complements rose, double stranded DNA fell. And very interesting is even fatigue, which is usually very difficult to treat in autoimmune diseases and does not uh, correlate with disease activity. Even fatigue measures significantly fell and patients almost normalized. Uh, some biological concepts, as the CAR T cell uh, levels fell, gradually fell over 150 uh, days, the B cells started to rise. But this did not mean the patients cleared their proteinuria and sled I still remained the same. That is in a remission state. There were no new safety signals that were uh, identified. There were three, uh, two patients who, needed, who had a slight fever, which was labeled as minor CRS, that is uh, uh, cytokine release syndrome, which is a known uh, side effect of CAR T-cells, but they were not major. Next was obinutizumab and lupus nephritis. Here, 126 patients were randomly assigned 64 to obinutizumab and 62 to placebo. All the patients received MMF. And what they found is that there was complete clinical remission in about 40% of patients as opposed to 20% of patients who were continued on standard of care. And the way they gave obinutizumab is 1000 milligram on day 1 and then on day 15 or week 2 and then 24, 26 and all of them as I said received MMF. The biological effect was also seen and they found that obinutizumab's B cell depletion lasted for almost a year in up to 94, uh, the drug almost depleted 94% of B cells in these patients. Finally coming to lupus mortality which is the hardest outcome in lupus. Uh, this was a wonderful paper that was uh, published in Lancet recently by Eric Moran and group. Uh, what they found is they had, they had 70 uh, deaths which they analyzed. But the problem with this analysis is any death that happened before 6 months was excluded because they didn't have their clinical data. And to, uh, what they simply found is patients who were on low disease activity and who maintained low, low disease activity status were less likely to die irrespective of their baseline clinical activity. So our target should be at achieving a low disease activity state, which is uh, clinically possible rather than a uh, complete remission. So they concluded that patients who achieved low disease activity in terms of LLRs and remain in LLRs for a longer time have a better chance for survival. But uh, as I said, this study looked at very late disease. You know, the median duration of illness in this study was almost eight years. So we, as part of Inspire group, which is curated by Professor Amit Adhavar, we have, this is an unpublished data. So we looked at our uh, patient base, all Pan-India patient base of 2,072 patients. And we had 170 deaths in a matter of three, three and a half years, which we analyzed. 
and we did a cluster, uh, we did a cluster analysis based on these 25 variables. These variables are basically clinically relevant variables. Joanna uh, and onset, probably as a positive outcome, any antiphospholipid antibody that is positive, and then all the usually detected uh, autoantibodies by ENA uh, complements. Then we took the bilag measured domains, that is whoever had, uh, whoever was positive for any of these uh, domains. Then we took the, I'm uh, sorry, God, it is not cut. Uh, we also took sled eye and slick API at the end. And what we found is, the cluster 4, <coughs> this cluster had the worst outcome with maximum mortality. So if you see this cluster, and this cluster 4 and cluster 2 almost are similar in terms of disease activity, which is unfortunately cut down, cut off by the screen. Uh, they had a similar slide of 11, very high disease activity. But cluster 2 had lesser SM, UNRNP, high DSDNA histone nucleosome, whereas cluster 4 also had high DSDNA nucleosome but very high UNRNP SM. And this was the cluster for some reason having a lot of mortality. So we thought it might be because of a treatment. And we did a uh, uh, multivariate regression. Uh, and we found that it is actually the socioeconomic status which was determining mortality along with the cluster variables themselves. But none of the treatment parameters, ever receiving pulse steroid, cyclophosphamide use, MMF use, presence of proliferative lupus nephritis and age did not matter in determining, uh, did not contribute to mortality. So to summarize, we found that lupus from socio, lower socioeconomic background with high disease activity are positive, and who are positive for both DSDNA and related antibodies like histone nucleosome as well as SMD1 had higher mortality uh, and the previous study had shown us that in the long term maybe if you achieve low disease activity status very fast these are the patients who we can save in the long term. Thank you. Then the GWAS and also they have analyzed the previous studies, they have done a meta-analysis and then came to the conclusion. So in other studies they have shown that the interferon related genes are significantly affected by the epigenetic pathways. So we still don't know the name. Uh, the, the study that you showed uh, uh, in the past, uh, how many patients were those who were the the last one that you showed that those who had U1 RMP and the SM and and the DSA in a homogeneous? Uh, what was the number of patients? Do you remember? No, sir. Uh, uh, actually, the is there any data on uh, lower socioeconomic class with? Uh, sort of the ANA profile in patients or, or, or ethnicity and that kind of data? So we could not observe any clusters based on lower social economic status uh, that did, did determine the cluster at least. So uh, how the antibodies clustered with social economic status we have not analyzed in this. Uh, but uh, these patients were at least 80, more than 80 percent were at least positive for all the things, for uh, antibodies in the cluster 4. both speakers regarding the talk on chokrits I would like to know what is the status of rituximab in severe chokrit syndrome which is refracted into usual uh, treatment what is the status of rituximab so in the light of this presentation uh, actually I haven't uh, covered that topic here because the all the three studies which have been published are much older and uh, all the three studies haven't shown much significant interest. However, newer and CD20 targeting drugs are being tried, but however, they are still not in uh, clinical phase of trials. So, literature as such has not been shown to be very effective. Uh, Dr. Sakhi. Great talk from Buddhist speakers. Uh, Dr. to Dr. Naidu. The ultrasound findings that you showed, the hypoechoic shadows, what do they represent? Are they ducts or uh, Lymph, uh, lymphoid tissue or? Uh, personally, I am not sure, but I will check if I can. I think these are the uh, areas where there is a lot of destruction going on in the uh, 
Is it necrotic? Necrotic debris should not be there. Uh, not the necrotic, but the periductal inflammation and the uh, probably the ductal damage happening over there. At least not glandular tissue. Replaced by something. Any more question? Thank you, ma'am, for the introduction and uh, thank you, organizers, uh, for this topic on uh, antiphospholipid syndrome in 2022. I have no disclosures. Uh, to begin with, at the outset, so something that is uh, common to these stars is uh, Dr. Ranjan was supposed to take the talk, very much like Imran Ashmi was supposed to star in uh, Once Upon a Time in Mumbai 2. But uh, unfortunately, he was replaced and I am replacing him. The film bomb, I hope it's not a clock show today. So that's his designation. And I am using most of the slides which have been provided by him. I have given some finishing touches. Uh, this is how uh, I am going to talk for next 20 minutes. We will first start with the classification, what has really changed, including the draft which was uh, uh, showcased in uh, ACR 2022. Therapeutic armamentarium, is there anything new here or the same old debate of uh, direct uh, oral anticoagulants versus warfarin? There is a new risk prediction tool uh, which is used for estimating ischemic stroke in patients who have APS. Management in obstetric APS and then we will wind up looking at antiphospholipid syndrome, infertility and pregnancy outcomes. So uh, back in 99, this was the first attempt when they were trying to classify antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. There were two core domains here, clinical and lab. I think we all are aware. What has changed from 99 to uh, 2006 update is the persistence at six weeks was one of the limitations which was highlighted in that 1999 classification. There were no non-criteria features and anti-beta-2 GP1 was excluded. So in this update at Sydney, the duration for which the persistence of antibodies should be shown has been changed to 12 weeks and beta 2 GP1 antibody has been added. But then we all are talking about numbers, we love the number games, be it on the Mahatma Gandhi note or whatever. So this new classification came up uh, based on scoring system. So again, what was most important was there, there is an entry criteria which would mean that there has to be one clinical and one lab feature. The clinical feature, we will go uh, and discuss in detail each of these. Most important is in each domain, the most weighted score needs to be taken into account. It should not add all the domains and there should not be a likely explanation for that manifestation other than APS. So this is how it looks like. On, on the left side is the clinical domain and on the right side is the lab domain. We'll go, we'll start with the lab domain which is our favorite. The highest point was given to persistence of uh, showing positive lupus anticoagulant, five points. And if both anti-cardiolipin and anti-beta-2 GP1 were positive, it fetched a score of seven. You also need to look at the definition for moderate and high positivity. There's a slight change here. Antiphospholipid titers measured by ELISA, if the titer was between 40 to 79 international unit, it was taken as moderate titer and if it was more than 80, it was taken as high titer. So fetching a score of 7 if they were dual positivity. In the clinical domain, there were more features defined. Obstetric, we all are aware of more than 3 consecutive less losses, less than 10 weeks. Obviously, it should not be explained by any other causes. Fetal death, less than 16 weeks and six, more than 16 and 34 weeks was added without preeclampsia or features suggestive of placental insufficiency. Severe PEC preeclampsia or was or less than 34 weeks or an AND were given a score of 3 and 4 each. The non obstetric domains which were added included cardiac valve thickening in vegetation, fetching a score of 2 and 4. Thrombocytopenia fetching a score of 2. They also included microvascular involvement, 
which was divided into two domains, suspected when there was no pathological proof, that is, there was no biopsy, like features like libido racemosa, libidoid vasculopathy. However, if there was uh, a biopsy available and it was proven libidoid vasculopathy, it was taken as established. And the score was 2 and 5 respectively. In venous thrombosis and arterial thrombosis, they define these two subsets. The ones who had major risk factors, they were getting a score of 1 and 3 when it was venous thromboembolism. Whereas in patients who have arterial thrombos thrombosis with a high CVD risk profile would fetch a lower score because there were more risk factors which could result in arterial thrombosis. So these were the risk factors which they are defined, defined for venous thromb thrombosis and this is for the arterial thrombosis. So if you look at high CVD risk, we still don't have the definition for it, but severe arterial hypertension, long-standing diabetes, severe hyperlipidemia, CKD was defined as high CVD risk and would fetch a score of 2 instead of 4. Low CVD risk within presence of arterial thrombosis was defined as non-severe arterial hypertension. Diabetes again, we, we still don't have the duration here. Moderate hyperlipidemia, obesity and current tobacco smoking. Similarly for venous thromboembolism, the definition for major risk factors which was active malignancy, hospital administration, major trauma and high risk surgery were defined. And this is how you will classify a score after meeting the entry criteria, a score of three or more from each of the clinical as well as the lab domain, the patient would be classified as anti postoperative antibody syndrome. And we all know it's we are talking about classification and not diagnosis. What was the strength? There was one clinical and one uh, lab domain added. There was risk stratification done for macrovascular events, microvascular domains were also added, pregnancy morbidity have been defined, cardiac disease as well as thrombocytopenia has been added. And if you would read very closely, in the previous classification, IgM and or IgG was mentioned. Here they have separated both the subtypes and the scoring system is weighted accordingly. IgG is given more weightage. Because we all know because of infection, there is chances that you may get transient positivity of these antibodies. Uh, after having gone through classification, what is next is, what is change in the management really? Has anything really changed? We all know the pathways which are implicated in uh, thrombosis, including the uh, uh, deficiency of other factors and thrombophilia profiles. The major debate and the major data which has been published in 2022 is the systematic review which has been done for randomized control trials and some case studies comparing these newer anticoagulants with vitamin K antagonists. So they did a subgroup analysis where they compared the four RCTs which were available. Most of these RCTs are for Rivaroxaban and there is one RCT done on Epixaban. They found that overall thromboembolic events in the two groups, be it the randomized control trial or the cohort, was there was no increased risk of thromboembolism in both the groups. When I say thromboembolism, it's both arterial as well as venous because if you look at the uh, forest plot, the p-value was insignificant. There was mild heterogeneity in the study. I square was only was 24, and you can see that it is still it is touching the baseline. So there was not much of a difference between the two groups, the warfarin and the newer anticoagulant. Then they decided to compare venous thromboembolism, arterial thromboembolism, and also look at the side effects. Again, no difference between the two groups. Be it randomized control trial be it the cohorts or even if they total, total up all these studies together, there was no difference in the two groups. So this was reassuring that at least there is no increased risk of venous thromboembolism because of these drugs. But the major issue was arterial thromboembolism. Look at these randomized control trials, which in, in fact the RAP study was stopped, the TRAP study was stopped because of uh, increased risk of thrombosis and it had to be stopped midway which was actually trying to assess Rivaroxaban versus uh, warfarin. There is an increased risk of arterial thrombosis. Uh, if you see randomized controlled trial in isolation or you combine both the studies, there is 2.27 times increased risk of getting an arter arterial thrombosis while using Rivaroxaban or Apixaban in patients who have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. The bleeding risk was similar in both the groups. All-cause mortality again was similar in both the groups, focusing mainly on the randomized controlled trial. Then they wanted to, in this analysis, they wanted to understand 
is it one particular drug which is you know skewing the graph is it a subset of patients who have increased risk of arterial thrombosis for example those who have triple positivity <coughs> those who have arterial thrombosis will the analysis differ so they do look at triple versus non triple positivity in studies where they had this data where they had defined triple positivity definitely there was an increased risk of thrombolytic events we are we are arterial or venous however in single versus double antibody positive the risk was similar between the two groups similarly the bleeding risk overall also similar and we triple or non triple positive group the bleeding risk was similar between the two groups then they looked at individual uh, newer anticoagulants which are available <coughs> interestingly rivaroxaban was a major culprit but then most of the studies have been on rivaroxaban there are only a few studies on apixaban including one latest uh, uh, study which has which are not included which has been published again they found increased risk of stroke in these patients who were given apixaban there are around 48 patients it has only been recently published so among the subgroup analysis it was this drug which was associated with more thromboembolic events as compared to apixaban versus warfarin or dabigatran versus warfarin similarly for arterial thromboembolism again the rivaroxaban group if you look at venous thromboembolism this was more or less similar and major bleeding again more or less similar the the next question that came to uh, one of the authors mine and i am happy that a lot of these studies have only come in 2022 it made relatively easier to uh, read the uh, publications because systematic review always helps so they wanted to see can we really isolate patients who had prior history of arterial thrombosis and then see if giving newer anticoagulant in this subset results in more of these events but unfortunately unfortunately to the uh, pharmaceutical companies as well they did not find this difference which means even if we analyzed only those set of patients who did not have arterial thrombosis even in those subgroups there was an increased risk of arterial thrombosis when we were trying to use newer anticoagulants in these patients of anti phospholipid antibody syndrome so ultimately the recommendations have come we the european society of rheumatology uh, the europe the eula or the bsr first choice invariably is warfarin even if you want to do a subgroup patients who have arterial thrombosis or triple positivity unless there is a contraindication you have to use warfarin in these patients you may consider newer anticoagulants in patients who have venous thrombosis with non triple positivity if you are not able to use warfarin but if you look at the graph it still the first choice even in this subset the preference is being given to warfarin next few minutes maybe 5 10 minutes we'll focus on what is new in the prediction tools and the management in obstetric aps so this gap score has been available since quite a long time and it looks at predict basically it predicts thrombosis or uh, pregnancy outcomes in patients who have anti phospholipid they wanted to identify some subsets some parameters by which can they really predict stroke in patients who have aps so this is this is the one which was which is the uh, older one the global anti phospholipid syndrome score it is a weighted score where hyperlipidemia is given a score of 3 arterial hypertension you will note that they have also used antibodies against phosphatidyl serine and prothrombin time uh, in this scoring but in the adjusted gap score which was actually meant for assessing risk of stroke they have removed this uh, parameter they formed two cohorts a training cohort a validation cohort and they look at the parameters they followed on these patients for 2.7 years and they looked up at the they made there were two groups patients who had ischemic stroke who did not have any ischemic stroke and they found that patient age the adjusted gap score and underlying autoimmune disease hypertension diabetes were some of the risk factors which were associated with increased chances of getting an ischemic stroke similarly looking at uh, the antibodies thrombocytopenia was significantly associated was higher in group which had ischemic stroke so this was their uh, you know analysis at the end that 
if we combine these parameters with the adjusted gap score can we utilize it or predict the chances of ischemic stroke in cohort of patients who have antiphospholipid so this was the training cohort this was the validation cohort this is the adjusted gap score and this is the the the, the newer one where they have given again a weighted scoring age diabetes platelet hyperuricemia adjusted gap score a total summation of these group is to be done higher the score higher are the chances of getting ischemic stroke in future so this is something new which was published uh, in frontiers in 2022 the other questions which were analyzed in 2022 is does steroid have any role in obstetric ats whether low dose or high dose does it really change the outcome so they looked at uh, abortion overall rates in abortion and they also do the data subgroup analysis looking at low dose which is less than 20 or less than 20 mg or a high dose in both the groups there was no difference in rates of abortion which means besides adding aspirin and low molecular aparin as indicated there is actually no role of adding steroids as far as obstetric outcome is concerned if there are some other compelling indication then it's a different story interestingly they found unfortunately they found that there was an increased risk of preeclampsia gestational diabetes and preterm births mm -hmm. if steroids was used in females with obstetric aps so this is something we need to keep in mind that these are these are the issues that we will face if we are using steroids another interesting network analysis trying to compare all the treatment options which are available which people have tried where this larger the size of this blue dot means more studies more more is the number of patients and if you look at the thickness of this horizon this bar that means more number of trials are available comparing aspirin with low molecular weight versus aspirin and so on and so forth here also if you look most of the studies have used aspirin and low molecular weight aparin though there are some studies looking at use of iv iv steroids but most of the data that is available is for use of aspirin and low molecular weight aparin in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome they also wanted another interesting uh, scenario that often we face in opinions is when a gynec a gynecologist would refer a patient who under wants to undergo ivf and they have run antiphospholipid antibody profile in these patients and some of the antibodies have come out to be positive so there are studies which have looked at presence of these antibodies in females who want to undergo in vitro fertilization 3214 patients were analyzed and they looked at live birth rate clinical pregnancy rate and miscarriage rate whether these antibodies were affecting the outcome of ivf in these patients so if you looked at pregnancy rate there was not much of a difference again a forest plot if you looked at live birth rate again there was not there was some difference here p value was 0.03 in live birth rate and miscarriage risk again not much of a difference the p value was 0.46 so they concluded that there is some impact of presence of these because the question that probably would be asked to us is whether we should add aspirin and or low molecular weight aparin in this group APS in pregnancy outcome is there anything new in 2022 so here they had compared these are the various outcomes again a systematic review looking at live birth preeclampsia small for gestational age preterm birth and neonatal mortality in most of these analysis triple positivity or triple positivity for example in this group was associated with decreased chances of having a normal live birth similarly presence of lupus anticoagulant triple positivity was associated with increased risk of preeclampsia small for gestational age even preterm birth if you look at the strongest association is is with presence of lupus antibody i think we all are aware that la or triple positivity is something which we need to keep in mind in these group of patients when we have to counsel these patients and another question that was left unanswered is just presence of antibodies does the outcome really change so this was a population based study including around 12000 patients and they wanted to see whether presence of these subtype of antibodies resulted in fetal growth retardation and they found that presence of antiphospholipid antibodies of any type 
was resulting in increased chances of fetal growth retardation. Anticardiolipin was resulting in increased risk of uh, fetal growth retardation. Same was with beta 2 GP1 and interestingly lupus anticoagulant was not resulting. Near presence of this antibody was not associated with increased risk of uh, uh, low uh, uh, growth retardation. So this is all I have for today. What has really changed is the classification criteria. You need to remember the entry criteria and three or more points in each domain. The adjusted gap score along with these other parameters to pick up uh, to predict risk of ischemic stroke. Triple positivity, presence of lupus anticoagulant generally associated with poor outcome. Steroids have no role. The drug of choice still remains warfarin unless there is a contraindication or there is uh, allergy to warfarin. Thank you. Because of its easy accessibility, then clinical utility and also it can obviate the need of biopsy. That's why the search is on and on and research is going on. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Ruchika Goel, Professor, Department of Clinical Immunology and Rheumatology, Christian Medical College, Hello. A joint effort by Dr. Ranjan and Dr. Avinash. I am coming to we are coming back to again a little bit of a drier topic, which is can be classified into so, some diagnostic biomarkers, the biomarkers associated, I mean, used for disease activity monitoring, organ involvement and response to therapy, or uh, meaning to say, this, uh, prognosticating a disease. So, as Sir had rightly pointed out, it can be divided into, you have serum biomarkers, which includes various proteins and metabolites, then you have serum <laughs> antibodies, then you have the genetic markers, some of the biomarkers, and finally you have cellular biomarkers, and I will be covering each one of them a little bit in detail. But before going to the biomarkers, we should understand where are we with them. So this is the, uh, these are the stages of biomarker development, where you have a discovery, where you discover a candidate marker, then you verify it in individual studies, and if the biomarker is good enough, you validate it in across uh, various cohorts, and then finally you utilize it in clinical practice and try to understand the clinical utility. And at the outset, I would like to basically say that most of the biomarkers which we will be discussing have not gone through all these stages. And some of the biomarkers which are just reaching this, completing this stage of development, I would have, I have actually inserted this diagram in, uh, I mean this uh, particular picture uh, against those slides. So first coming to the small vessel vasculitis and the associated. So as we all know, conventional biomarker which is available are the antibodies, anti-PR3 and MPO antibody. So there was a systematic review and meta-analysis wherein they showed that for relapses, the C anchor testing by immunofluorescence, it has a pool sensitivity of 75% and a pool specificity of 98%. It is better, the pool data as such is better for PR3 antibody immunoassay. And when you look at both, as far as P anchor is concerned, immunofluorescence as well as uh, immunoassays all together, the sensitivity for anti mpo antibody actually ranged between 46 to 58 percent, whereas the specificity was good enough. So, meaning to say, there is a scope for improvement in the performance of these two antibodies. So, first we come to what has happened over these times in understanding of utility of ANCA and disease activity assessment. So, these are multiple studies which have been very nicely synopsized in a review wherein they have looked that you have two types of anchors, you have pathogenic anchors and non-pathogenic anchors and uh, the authors of different studies, they postulate that it's probably the non-pathogenic anchors which are, uh, which are diluting the, uh, the, the clinical utility of anchor testing. So, uh, various studies have actually looked at, a couple of studies have looked at whether the epitope which is recognized by pathogenic ANCA is different as compared to non-pathogenic ANCA and if we are able to dissect out as to which epitope this particular ANCA antibody is targeting, probably we may be able to in improve the performance of ANCA testing. So they actually postulated and they have demonstrated actually that the C-terminal shift in the epitope and the antibodies which are recognizing this particular shift in the epitope and is probably it, that was shown to be 
better associated with relapses in ankylosis. So these are various studies by themselves and very beautifully done studies. Then the second thing is instead of testing ANCA, whether we test the avidity of ANCA interaction between the membrane antigen and these antibodies. And in various studies, they also they found these studies that the after testing for the avidity of interaction between ANCA and membrane antigen, they were able these uh, these antibodies which are which had a better avidity actually correlated with relapses better in patients with renal impairment. And the third thing I think most of us are aware of that instead of testing for a whole IgG PR3 ANCA antibody, why don't we study the hypothyalated antibody because that is supposed to be correlating better with disease activity. So what is actually the role of antibodies as a diagnostic marker as well as as a disease activity assessment? Where are we? So this is actually a study which has come very recently in 2022 wherein they have looked at dual positivity of ANCA with anti-GPM antibodies. And what they found is that a combination that is a dual positivity of uh, uh, dual positivity for these two antibodies was basically associated with more of crescentic glomerulonephritis, fewer sclerotic lesions and significantly lower one year survival. So that thus defining the utility of testing these antibodies to determine the phenotype of patient. Second thing is what is the role of ANCA? in deciding disease activity. So this again, there was a study in which they have shown that actually if you look at ANCA levels, the PR3 ANCA levels does not correlate with disease activity in 25% of ANCA vasculitis patients, whereas 15% of the patients in complete remission had persistently, persistently positive PR3 ANCA for more than 12 months, thus making PR3 ANCA also as an imperfect biomarker and again, to improve the performance of these antibodies, there are various methods which I have already alluded to in the previous slides. So we just go to a couple of uh, individual studies. Individual studies means they have not been replicated, but however, these are single, single studies. So this is basically a, a study in which they have looked at the presence of anti-MPO antibody and anti-proteinase 3 antibody whether they are able to predict the nephritis flare in patients with ankylosis. So this is a mark, this basically the performance of these antibodies as disease activity marker. So what they found is that the MPO antibody at three months prior to relapse, as measured by multiplex flow immunoassay. So basically we are moving away from immun immunofluorescence and we are coming to the better. Um, testing modalities for these ANCAs. So while when they use these advanced methods, that is multiplex flow immunoassay for MPO antibody and immunoassay chemiluminescence for PR3 antibodies, they found that these antibodies correlated better with renal relapse after three months. Meaning to say, if you improve the assays or the type of assays which you are using, it may improve the performance of antibody in measuring the disease activity. Now, this is one study I would like to go in detail because this is a study which is probably coming very much near to our uh, uh, the final stages of development of biomarkers in ankylosis. So, this is basically the Neptune network, wherein they have done the study in three different cohorts. I must say four different cohorts. So, initially they looked at the study cohort was a prospective patient. Uh, it's a prospective study of patients, 84 patients with renal anchor vasculitis. So this was kind of a discovery cohort. Then the authors, actually the investigators went on to real world cohort wherein they included anchor vasculitis, healthy controls and disease controls. And they also took nephrotic syndrome patients who had significant proteinuria as a result of photocytopathy. Finally, they went on to test the results in the renal, in, in again another set of patients who had proteinuria along uh, and the renal anchor vasculitis patients who had or did not have proteinuria. And what actually they wanted to check for is basically they have assayed the urinary soluble CD163 marker, which is basically the, the, so the marker which is present on the macrophage. Uh, macrophage it's a scavenger receptor present on the macrophages. So the modality used was ELISA. And what they found is that, that 
The urinary CD163, actually soluble CD163, 163, was associated with active renal disease and was much higher in patients with active renal disease as compared to remission. This particular marker was associated with renal vasculitis flare during follow-up and what happened is well, then they looked at the disease control and what they found is that this particular marker was actually could differentiate anchor vasculitis flare from the other mimics. But the only problem was that it could not differentiate patients of renal flare with, uh, from the nephrotic syndrome patients. So basically then they looked at whether you could improve the performance by adjusting it for the proteinuria and they found yes, the correction of for urine protein instead of creatinine actually restored the diagnostic accuracy for detection of active renal vasculitis and the AUC was 0.91 with a very low confidence interval. So meaning to say this biomarker may actually is making its way forward for coming into clinical practice soon. Yet another study which is again making this biomarker more promising. It is basically a Japanese study wherein again they have looked at urinary CD163 and also another marker which is urinary CD11B. And they found both these markers at the diagnosis was associated with crescentic glomerular nephritis and leukocyte accumulation and anchor glomerular nephritis. So it was, they found, they actually, it may be a good marker when which, which may obviate the need for renal biopsy, especially if you are dealing with childhood anchor vasculitis. And these, they, both CD11B and CD163 was associated with the renal relapse as well as poor renal outcome. Along with that, they also looked at the circulating CD163. And what they found is that there was an inverse relationship between circulating CD163. So renal lapse, relapse was associated with lower levels of circulating CD163 but higher levels of urinary CD163. Now moving on to another marker which is useful. Uh, it is basically the biomarker for identifying organ involvement in anchor vasculitis. So we have this, uh, this was a study which was conducted in patients with microscopic polyangitis and they had looked at the presence of neuropathy and also they had looked at disease controls who had non inflammatory neurological diseases. And they actually studied around 14 serum biomarkers and they found that among all the biomarkers tested, the serum TIMPA1 levels were associated with the presence of uh, motor neuropathy. So the lower the markers of TIMP1, the higher chances of patient having a motor neuropathy in patients with MPA vasculitis. Now, I will just briefly just uh, kind of mention these studies because these all biomarkers have been tested in single studies and I think uh, we are not, uh, we probably may not be discussing them in detail. So one is serum chitinase 3-like 1 protein popularly known as YK40. This is one protein which has been found in this particular observational study to be a useful biomarker to associate disease activity in anchor associated vasculitis. However, there are many, there are not many studies who have kind of replicated this particular observation, so I will not be discussing in future. Now, what about the genetic markers? Just to give a glimpse of this genetic markers, this is the neutrophil beta 2 integral LFA1 protein. So this actually has been tried in anchor vasculitis as a potential biomarker, as a potential biomechanistic marker to identify active disease. And again, there's only one study, so I will not be discussing it in detail. Now what about the cellular markers? So the first, I found this int interesting actually. It is looking at lymphopenia in anchor vasculitis and correlating it with renal outcome. So this is a prognostic marker basically. So this was a retrospective study of multiple centers in France wherein they had looked at 145 patients with AAV. And what they found is the lymphopenia at diagnosis was associated with lower EGFR and it also correlated with the press percentage of sclerotic gromuli and lymphopenia was associated, I was taken, uh, was found to have an independent risk factor for end stage renal disease. Moving on to further cellular markers, again a brief mention that now we are moving to the T cell subset. Again, I found it interesting because most of the studies where they have looked at only T cell subset. So this is the T cell subset in GPA. So this is what basically they uh, there are multiple studies which have looked at the presence of chemokine receptors on various T cell subsets. 
So what uh, in this study in which they have looked at GPA patients, they found that there is a decreased frequency of naive T cells and an increased frequency of very early memory cells, especially those who are bearing the CCR6 and CCR4 chemokine receptors, they are associated with increased risk of uh, relapse in future. Now again, moving to the same kind of a study in MPA vascular, in microscopic polyangitis or anti-MPO positive anka vasculitis patients, again the similar results were found except for the fact that there was a decrease in CCR6 T cells but another chemokine receptor, this is CXCR3 plus T cells, they were shown to be associated with active MPO, uh, uh, active disease activity and MPO associated vasculitis. Now, moving on to the markers which actually determine the response to therapy. This is an now a couple of studies will probably be interesting because they are more towards your clinical aspect. So, this is a retrospective study of 70 patients who actually 70 patients who had been treated with rituximab and were followed up for 10 years. And what they basically found is uh, yeah, what they basically found is that one when they looked at the pieces and they uh, tried to look at basically they plot uh, the they estimated the pieces using high resolution flow cytometry and they looked at the memory B cells. What they found is that the increase in the memory B cells and a decrease, this is basically for the naive B cells, that if, they, if you have more naive B cells repopulating after rituximab therapy, that was associated with a better survival as compared to the patients who did not have repopulation with the naive B, uh, naive B cells at 6 months. population at 6 months was associated with longer time to relapse. This is another study, I have again put it as, this is something which is probably a couple of, uh, I think 3 studies are there which are looking at on particular phenotype of B-cells which is ID, IgD negative, CD27 high and CD38 high B-cells. So this first study is basically in GPA patients wherein they found that higher level of this particular B cell uh, subset was actually associated with lower survival as compared to the patients who had uh, these B cells below one particular limit cutoff. And these B cells actually decreased as the patients were treated successfully with rituximab. There's another study wherein they have looked at again the alkavasculitis patients in active stage and they found that increase in circulation, circulating uh, B cell subset, this B cell subset was associated with Higher, uh, uh, higher serum creatinine, lower GFR and the increase in total percentage of total crescents in renal biopsy. So we need to say that this particular bio, actually cellular biomarker may guide us to therapy, uh, to response to rituximab in patients with ankyovasculitis. Now what about a word about, now moving away from ankyovasculitis, we have non ankyovasculitis The first one is the hinox shonley purpura. So I have just quoted one study, this is actually a systematic review and meta-analysis wherein they have looked at the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio in patients with GI involvement in noxionyl purpura. And what this meta-analysis have found that high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio was associated with more severe gastrointestinal involvement in patients with HSP. Now we come to large vessel vasculitis which I have been actually working on. So again, the biomarker in large vessel vasculitis has to have four components. It should correlate with disease activity. It may sh should look at arterial remodeling, fibrosis and angiographic progression. So you can actually, nowadays, they can be divided as the biomarkers which are associated IL-6 axis and the biomarkers which are not associated with IL-6 axis because tocilizumab is being used mainly uh, in a lot of patients who are refractory to conventional uh, cytotoxic agents in tachyosuartritis. 
So, this ESR, CRP, serum amyloidin, they are actually the markers which depend on INSS pathway. Whereas, the totally independent biomarkers are pentastic, pentaxin field, S100 proteins, and BGF and angiopoietins. So, this are just synopsis because you know, all these biomarkers, they have been used in different, different studies, including our studies in our patients. But again, these, none of these biomarkers have actually made way to clinical practice except for interleukin-6 which has been replicated in multiple studies as a diagnostic as well as a, a biomarker which is associated with disease activity and assessment. So this was one study. So the next thing is that do we combine the biomarkers and see if they respond, if they are able to uh, uh, basically decide on disease activity and there's a desperate need. So this is a study which actually I had, uh, we had been looking at in our department wherein we looked at 85 patients and we actually phenotyped them with 18 biomarkers and what we found is that nothing other than angiopotin 2 actually differentiated active disease from stable disease. Interleukin say 18 levels were associated with a histological activity but what was interesting, it's, uh, just bear with me this uh, second last slide. So, what actually differentiated the, uh, what, what was interesting is that more than the level of the biomarkers, it is the interaction with the biomarkers which changes between active and stable disease. So, this is another same offshoot of the same study wherein we looked at endothelial levels and the histological progression and we found that increased endothelial levels at the baseline was associated with decreased angiography progression. We are not able to explain this finding, but this was a finding which we got from our patients. So these are further new postulated candidates, which I think again have been looked at in single, single studies, and probably it's not the time to discuss with them. So the take home message is, there has been a progress for diagnostic and prognostic markers in anchor vasculitis, especially the ones which are associated with specific organ involvement. The B-cell subsets are now being further explored to enhance response to rituximab and anchor vasculitis and predict relapses. The neutrophil lymphocyte ratio has a potential for prognosing HSP and there is an unmet need for disease activity in large vessel vasculitis for the markers meeting the uh, standards for use as a biomarker in clinical practice. Thank you for bearing with me. There are any questions? Hopefully not. Dr. Ruchika, excellent talk. Uh, as far as the markers are concerned, concerned, I was wondering whether you included IgG4 because in large vessel vasculitis, this might have a therapeutic application. Perhaps use of reduximab better than maybe uh, IL-6 inhibitor. Yeah, we did not use it in this study, but we had done a separate study of IgG4 levels in Tandemakar. Uh, I think probably we are filtering out those patients before making a diagnosis of Tandemakar. Um, um, the question was, uh, which patients, uh, the rituximab uh, and uh, nine B cells, I think it's true for rumor as well. And in those disease also usually relapse when you have more of uh, those kind of cells that are equaling after giving rituximab. I don't think it's specific for ankylosis device, right? but my question was, uh, I read a paper where in, in capillaritis phenotype of GPA and, and ankylosis in both, which means if you have alveolar hemorrhage or glucoronephritis or those kind of things, the anchor levels uh, preceded the relapse. So is there any particular subset, are you, are you doing anka on follow-up in your patients, uh, I mean PR3 and NPO, uh, in, in, sub, in certain subset of patients and all patients? So we do it in all patients every three months and uh, I mean the data for us is exactly the same as what has been shown, 20% relapse without an elevated anchor whereas another 15% do not relapse even with an elevated anchor. So I think uh, the, the whole shift is now going to assess the pathogenic anchor and define what is pathogenic anchor to improve the performance. And maybe immunoassays because they are able to detect the ankles at the lower threshold. But we do it for all patients as of now. And yes, it is not specific for ankles. I want to know 
Is there any role of D dimer in selling eccentric vasculitis? I came to know somewhere in some paper. Selling eccentric vasculitis, D dimer estimation, quite easily done. That is a good uh, marker for selling eccentric vasculitis. I came to know from some paper. Is there any uh, any medications required for uh, libido or reticular cellulose? Mm -hmm. Anti phospholipid. Or yes, setting of anti phospholipid antibodies. Only libido or reticular. No other obstructive cause. No, I don't think so. There is any role of any. So if that patient comes pregnant, only aspirin is required. Yeah. Then then it's again since you have the new. Uh, scoring based system, you may or may not be able to classify her. And if she doesn't have any pregnancy losses prior but has antibodies, you may want to consider low dose aspirin as per the EULA 2019 guidelines. So, with that, I think uh, we will close the session. Thank you for asking us to share. Cardiologist at Poverty Hospital, Bengaluru. And uh, uh, Dr. P.S. Uh, Arun Rajamudan, who is Associate Professor and Head of the uh, Institute of Rheumatology, Chennai. So please welcome the Chair of the session. Uh, has two topics. First one is uh, myositis advances. Uh, for this, I invite uh, Dr. Ingrid Lundberg to talk on uh, myositis advances. Welcome. I'm a professor of rheumatology in Karolinska in Stockholm, Sweden. And first, thank you for your kind introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to attend your, your I think, very uh, exciting meeting. This is not only a muscle disease, but it's frequently a systemic inflammatory disease also involving the skin, the lungs, the joints and sometimes the heart. Uh, a major say, uh, development of the last decades has been the discovery of several autoantibodies that are specific for the myositis disease. And they are important in, as a tool for diagnosis, but also to identify subgroups with different clinical phenotypes and prognosis. So the largest of the autoantibody defined subgroups is the androgenitase syndrome. And then we have five autoantibodies associated with dermatomyositis and one of them with lung disease. We have two autoantibodies associated with severe muscle weakness, the neck myopathy, the NDSRD and the HBCR. And then we have one associated with infusion body myositis and a novel autoantibody that's targeting a muscle specific protein there as you want. And then, in addition to the myositis specific autoantibodies, many of the patients with myositis have one of the so called myositis associated autoantibodies that can also be uh, detected in other uh, connective tissue diseases, either as one monospecific autoantibody or in combination with the myositis uh, specific autoantibodies. So based on all these autoantibodies and the clinical and histopathological phenotypes, we have now all these subgroups of myositis. And we should not forget that we also have a quite large group that's zero negative. So, uh, I think we are all aware of the challenges with treating patients with myositis. So even if we use high doses of glucocorticoids in combination with um, other immunosuppressives, and treatment is effect is often quite disappointing and very few patients actually recover in their former muscle strain or go into remission. So there's a high need to improve treatment. And one hypothesis that we want to postulate is that we believe that different myositis subsets may benefit from different interventions, which then should guide us in, when we decide clinical trials. But also when we study the pathophysiology, it could be a 
tool to use to understand more of the molecular basis for the disease and on that, in that aspect then develop new therapies. And I will share you some unpublished data from, from our own research group where um, uh, my colleagues have, uh, in, in collaboration with the groups in the UK, Czech Republic, Norway and Denmark and Sweden, we have analyzed data from 1,348 patients with very well characterized uh, uh, clinical and laboratory features and they all have my scientists. And they used an unsupervised cluster analysis based on the autoantibodies and just taken this into the statistics they identified um, eight subgroups you can see the clusters here and one is dominated by the raw 52 another with the uh, PMSCL and then the third is uh, sorry the, the new one RP and then PMSCL and the fourth subgroup is dominated by MI2 and then we have the new one and then one subgroup here comes up with the JO1 and RO52 in combination. And then we have the T1 gamma, and the <coughs> group here is the zero negative. So that means that using both the associated and uh, my side specific antibodies, we can define these subgroups and then with some clinical phenotypes. But uh, maybe the even more interesting is that when you come to the HLA associations, that are, they are strongly associated with the water antibody defined subgroups compared to the classical clinical subgroups. So as, here are the HLA associations and here are the classical clinical subgroups. So if you take, as an example here, the dermatomyositis subgroup and associated with, with um, the HLA, you find that there are several associations between dermatomyositis and HLA. But when you look, for instance, at the T1 gamma, it's a more homogeneous HLA. So if we think that we believe that the HLA is very important in the activation here of the immune system and the uh, antigen target, we believe that subgroup being patients in this way, based on the autoantibodies, may be a way to understand which uh, antigen and risk factors there are and how this way of looking at the patients can guide us. So we have in particular focused to understand the disease development in patients with antigen 1 antibodies, which is the most common of the autoantibodies. And uh, so we have asked ourselves which is the major epitope of the histidine TNA synthetase, which is the target of the anti one antibodies, and are there clinical correlations to the epitope reactivity, and are there antigen specific T cells targeting SRS. So I'll start now with what we found concerning the major epitopes of the SRS protein. So this is the SRS protein and the constructs we use, we have the full length and then one uh, fragment called WEP, one CDU, one ABD. And we screen CRA from patients with anti one antibodies. And as you can see here, the major reactivity in this heat map is towards the WEP domain and also the splice variant which contains the WEP domain. So then we can conclude that the WEP domain is the major epitope of the SRS protein. And next, we, we uh, isolated IgG from plasma and from uh, PAL, bronchial lavage fluid. And then we analyzed both IgG and IgA in here, up in VAL fluid. And you can see you have the antibody to the full length and to the, the web domain in both the IgG and IgA uh, in the VAL fluid. So we have the antibodies in the lung, and we have them in the sera. But concerning one, if there is then a clinical correlate, I think what we found that in the BAL fluid, the IgG reactivity uh, to the web domain correlated with the four partner function. So we believe that this could be maybe a marker of um, prognosis, 
but also it supports the hypothesis that the lungs are important in the development of the antigen one positive disease. So then we have this identified this uh, web domain as the target of the antibodies, and then in the same uh, region we search for a possible epitope for the T cell reactivity for a peptide. And using in silico prediction, uh, one, our collaborator Eddie James in Seattle identified a peptide here of the protein. And we use this peptide to stimulate T cells from the patients with antigen 1 antibodies. And this is an example from one patient. And up here we have the unstimulated cells, and then cells from peripheral blood stimulated with the full length protein and with the, this peptide. And as readout, we use them um, as for T cell activate, activation, CD40 ligand. And we also measured production of interferon gamma, R2, and R17. And here it is the reference to unstimulated cells, and you can see that there is, with the stimulation with the, with the full length protein, you get the higher interferon gamma production and, and R2. And also with the peptide here, you have a marked activation of the T cells and the interferon gamma and the R2 in particular in this case. So from this case, we also had fluid from the bronchio and the lavage. And here is the same. We stimulate with the same peptide, the unstimulated cells, and cells stimulated with the full length protein and with the peptide. And if you look here, you have a remarkable activation of T cells in the, from the lung compartment. And in particular, you have a very high production of interferon gamma when you stimulate these cells with the peptide. And the experiments are summarized here to the right, where you can really see, I don't know why this doesn't really work, but here you see the, in the lower panel, here the high interferon gamma production, particularly in the cells from the lungs when they are stimulated with the peptide. So this again suggests that the lungs are important in the immune activation to this protein and, um, and uh, we are now in the phase of identifying antigen specific T cells using tetramer and, and peptides. But that uh, is ongoing. So then, of course, we are interested in the T cells in the muscle of the patients to understand what they are doing and how they cause the muscle weakness. So we have used the new single cell sequencing technique to uncover the T cell signatures uh, in patients with myositis. And for this, we took the fresh biopsy that we take for diagnostic purpose, and then we digested the muscle and uh, extracted the T cells that we sorted by flow cytometry and then at the same time we have the peripheral blood uh, as comparison. And for this study we involved the patients um, that we had the possibility to take the biopsy and extract T cells. And they are patients with anticipatory syndrome, dermatomyositis, inclusion body myositis, and immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. And then we have one patient that turned out to be a non-myositis, but a, a genetic my myopathy disorder that was also included. So uh, um, when we sort the cells and sequence the, the RNA expression, we clearly see two clusters. And you can see they're very different. The T cells in the, in the blue from the muscle and the green from the peripheral blood. And when you do the heat map, you can see they're totally different expressions. And uh, when you subgroup them, according to the CD4, CD8 population, you can see similar, that there are different cells phenotype in the blood and tissue. And again, emphasizing the importance of studying what's going on in the organ if you want to treat the patients. And then we investigated the T cell receptors, and by that we could identify uh, phenotypes of the T cells in the muscle and in the blood. <coughs> and what is striking then is that there are some clusters that you mainly see in the in the peripheral uh, in the muscle, like this tissue resident memory cells 
that express this uh, Hobbit marker. We can also see that there are cytotoxic T cells, uh, whereas there are some other phenotype in the, in the blood. And here we compare the blood uh, and with the muscle, and these are the individual patients that were included. And you can see that in particular these green or yellow cells are the ones that dominate in the tissue, whereas in, in the blood are more the central memory. <coughs> So this tells us that this is possible. And uh, then we were interested if the T cells have expanded and pro proliferated in the tissue, which would indicate that they are exposed to some antigen. And here is a summary from two patients. The one patient with antisynthetic syndrome, the one, the one with IBM. And indeed we found clonally expanded T cells. And by the definition here we use that uh, a clone was defined as having two or more T cells with the same CD, uh, CD3 uh, amino, amino acid fit sequence of the T cell receptor of both the alpha and beta chain. And um, the CD4 cells are here with the um, brownish background and the CD8 with the more beige background. And the muscle T cells are with the squares and the blood T cells with the and they are linked with the lines if they are clones. And you can see there are several clones in the, the one positive patients both in the CD4 and CD8, uh, CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells and in the IBM patients the major clones are in the CD8 uh, with a high expansion of the Hobbit expression CD8 uh, like the tissue resident cells. So we can indeed <coughs> see these expansions. And then we have two patients where we had the follow-up biopsy. And here I present the data from the patient with anti-synthetase, uh, anti one antibodies. And what you can see then, what we show here are the clones to the left, early diagnosis. And this patient had the re-biopsy after approximately nine months. She had been treated very aggressively with high doses of steroids, cyclophosphamide, and mycophenolate. And you can still see that she has uh, the same clones are present even after this heavy immunosuppressive treatment. And I think that would be interesting also in the, as we heard from the, how you can predict flares. Uh, and I think this is one sign that even though the patient is in clinical remission, in the tissue, there may be still, act, still present uh, these cells that can drive the disease and explain why the patients flare when we try to stop the treatment. So what we can conclude from this study is that we see a distinct muscle T cell signature and uh, that it is possible to do this on the muscle tissue. And we identify particular resident T cells in the tissue and uh, some subsets were found in all most subsets where <coughs> others were different between the different subgroups. But the major expansions of these cells were mainly found inside the toxic and tissue resident cells in both muscle and blood and they persisted after, after treatment. So then I want to discuss a little more on one other subgroup of patients, those with dermatomyositis and tip 1 gamma and cancer. As you know, we have a marker by marker for cancer, the tip 1 gamma, and that is present here in this UK study in 38%. They have cancer only in 38% of the ones with tip 1 gamma, but only 15% of the tip 1 gamma one gamma negative. But what is interesting is of those patients that have anti tip one gamma positive dermatomyositis, only 50% will develop cancer. So then who is at risk? What has also been shown by several groups, including our own, is that here the risk of cancer in patients with tip one gamma antibodies is clearly highest around the time of diagnosis. Here you can see the time of diagnosis at zero, and uh, the dark 
bar partial divorce of the T1 gamma positive patients. And with time, there are, less, there are few patients that develop cancer that have the anti T1 gamma antibodies. So then, I think this study came earlier this year from Dr. Lydia Kaskova Rosen and her colleagues at Johns Hopkins. And I would present to you some of the data from these studies I think that are very interesting. It's a, a new both antibody that is associated with attenuated cancer emergence in patients with anti T1 gamma. So here the investigators, they selected Sierra from patients that had T1 gamma positive dermatomyositis, and half of them did not have cancer and half had cancer. And then they used immune precipitation to identify new antibody uh, specificities. And then they subgrouped the patients into those that had cancer, close to DM diagnosis, those that had late concept cancer, and those that never had cancer. I don't know, can you, can you remove that? And what you can see that the number of bands here this is the T1 and gamma up here. Uh, but the other ones, with, uh, with the early cancer, there are a few bands, but there are more bands in patients with later cancer and even more in those patients that never developed cancer. And among those bands, they identified 10 antibodies, and the most frequent was the CCR1. And what they also found was that the CCR positive patients <coughs> had time to cancer was much longer, was four years, compared to the CCR negative patients that was less than a year. And furthermore, the anti-CCR1 positive patients, uh, some developed cancer later, but what was striking was that when they developed cancer, they were smaller and uh, fewer with metastasis according to these stages. Staging, uh, cancer staging, whereas the CCR negative had more of the severe cancer. <coughs> so to summarize this part with anti T1 gamma and cancer, there have been new autoantibodies, and one of them is anti CCR1, that is associated with decreased, decreased risk of cancer within three years from the DM diagnosis. And when it appears the cancer, it is milder. And this suggests that there is a more marked diverse immune response in some subgroups, and that is then there is less likely to develop cancers. And these new water antibodies may serve as biomarkers and guide us in the screening of uh, cancer risk for patients in anti T1 gamma, but they are not commercially available yet. So to conclude, the myositis specific water antibodies. They have identified clinically more homogeneous phenotypes of myositis, and the autoantibody defined subgroups may be a way to achieve a better understanding of the molecular physiology to improve treatment. It's possible to identify anti specific T cells, and it's also possible to phenotype T cells in muscle by using the single cell uh, sequencing. And the T1 gamma associated dermatomyositis. It may be a result of an immune reaction towards the tumor and a diversity of the immune response to protect against cancer development. And of course now we need to know more about this myositis subgroups and for this we need collaboration. And with this I want to invite you to this MyNet register where we share data and we can also um, uh, use the register to follow our patients and uh, we need these large collaborations. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators at Kremlinska and International. Thank you so much. I invite my next speaker, Dr. Kita Sarkar. She works for Mamta Banerjee. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody in West Bengal works for Mamta Banerjee. <laughs> That's why like that. she works. She's an associate professor at. Uh... Thank the organizers of IRACOM for inviting me to speak on this topic: updates and sustainable schools. Uh, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to speak on the pathophysiology of systemic sclerosis on clinician per se, 
clinical system is improving with the antibody stratification, updates in the management of system diseases and organ specific management from their cell that we track. Systemic sclerosis is an autoimmune disease of unknown origin, having the highest mortality and morbidity among all the rheumatological diseases. It has heterogeneous clinical manifestation, which cannot be picked up sometimes with the available cutaneous based substance. So it's important for us to include the antibody also. To understand that disease, we need to know the pathophysiology because pathophysiology helps us to develop new modality of therapy. In the pathophysiology, mainly this is a triad of vasculopathy, immune activation, and fibrosis. In the initial part of the system is sclerosis. There is endothelial injury. This endothelial injury leads to the endothelial activation. Endothelial activation, then releasing large amount of cytokines, what factors, etc., which acts on the immune cells. This immune cells get activated, leading to the production of various autoantibodies and pro-fibrotic type of cytokines. These cytokines act on the fibroblasts. This fibroblast now change to the more pro-fibrotic type of myofibroblasts, ultimately secreting large amount of extracellular matrix which deposited around the tissues and leading to the organ damage. Once a patient has fulfilled the criteria of systemic sclerosis. The pathobiology is already advanced significantly. So now there is an interest of picking up the case of preclinical systemic sclerosis. So in the preclinical systemic sclerosis, there is some connective tissue disease, sinus syndrome, but it does not fulfill the criteria of 2013. So, in the assessment of systemic sclerosis, only cutaneous based subsets which we are using like diffuse and limited period which does not pick up many of the variability in the clinical manifestation and also in the rate of disease progression as well as response of the therapy. Especially certain antibodies which has, uh, can predict the organ involvement such as uh, renal involvement or cardiac involvement. So autoantibody remains one of the another part for evaluation of the preclinical system sclerosis. Uh, and from the evidence, if we see in the preclinical state, one of the large cohort in the Euster cohort, we have seen that if patient is coming renal phenomena for the first time, we also looked at the vascular abnormality using the nail fall capillaroscope and also auto -interval. Patient having both the abnormality in vascular, vasculature as well as antibody, 80% of these patients develop in the systemic sclerosis in the median time of 5 years. However, patients who are negative, both auto -interval as well as vascular abnormality, minimum percentage develop in the system sclerosis. So whenever a patient is coming for the first time with the connective tissue disease, clinical signs and symptoms, we also look for the antibody and vascular abnormality. So uh, the guideline with which we are following now is updated way back in 2017. So uh, let's see what has changed in the last few years. Uh, for that, I have shared in the uh, of med, uh, between 2021 and 2022. There I found almost 1700 articles available, of which 29 are randomized controlled trials. So I am going to include here only some which are very important, I believe. And I am going to make it very simple in the organ based manner. In the scheme, these are the already established treatment which was already established in the 2017. Now, let's see what are the changes 
It has been. Tossilism, Nintendere, Lenivism, Abatisset, Ryoshio God. All of them show clinical efficacy in the preclinical state. However, in the clinical trial, they could not meet the primary endpoints and improving in scale. Recently, Rituximab and Tophacetanin showed clinically significant in the clinical trial in the improvement of skin tightening. So, Rituximab is also used in the interstitial lung disease. I am going to elaborate in the section of interstitial lung disease. Now, Tophacetanin. Tophacetanin is a Zach inhibitor. In the recent pilot trial, it is shown that patient has been assigned to either tofacetinib 5 mg twice daily or in the metotrex at 10 mg weekly. The primary endpoint they have checked the change in the MRSS where it's seen that tofacetinib perform 44% higher in the improvement of skin. And they also looked at as a secondary endpoint the skin tightening using the ultrasound. There, here we can see there is there is significant decline in the MRSS. This is metotrexate group. This is a tofacetidine group. Similarly, in the ultrasound, there is also a decrease in the thickness of the skin using the ultrasound. And very interesting, one thing is in visitor lungs. Here, as a second real point, they have checked between the tofacetidine and the metotrexate. Patient receiving metotrexate, they, there, there is no improvement in the skin digital ulcer and also a few new ulcer has been developed. However, in the patient receiving tofacetinib, here the older ulcers are improved and no ulcers have been developed. So from this disease, it seems tofacetinib is going to be a normal market, normal as in, in the near future. So we will need to value it in the larger trials. So the next session is in the interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease is the commonest cause of death in systemic sclerosis. Cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate are the standard of care which we are using. In the recent time, the nintadenev, tofacetinib, rituximab, all of them showed improvement in the interstitial lung disease. So I am coming one by one. Nintendinib trial was published in 2019, though I am including here because many of the subset studies has been included in my, my talk. So here they have taken patient both diffuse and limited variant and they are assigned to either Nintendinib or placebo. Patients were having mycophenolate, about half of them in the baseline. At 50 to do it, it seems that there is a significant further decline in the placebo group. However, there is a less decline patient receiving the nintadenib. Here also we can see that nintadenib group maintain the lung function in the long term and the placebo group is declining. So from here they concluded the annual rate of decline is decrease in patient receiving nintadenib. We also looked at open level exchange. Here still the nintadenib continue to prevent from the other decline compared to the placebo group. Now let's move on to the anti-inflammatory IL-6 receptor inhibitor that is tosol. Focus study here, patients were taken were all are diffuse systemic skills and they have high inflammatory markers in the form of CRT and ESR. They are assigned either tocilizumab or in the placebo group. At primary endpoint, here we can see both are declining. Though the decline is in favor of tocilizumab, there is no clinically significant statistic. On the other hand, in the secondary endpoint, here, the decline in the ABC person is predicted, which was much less, in fact, not declining in the tocilizumab group compared to the placebo. So they also look at in the long term open extension levels where 
what the both the group was assigned to the tosalism and both the group remains the function lung function still so from this study they have concluded that tosalism is a potent preventer for the progression of the interstitial lung disease now let's move on to the antibodies at the let us some map here they recently they, there is a desire trial has been published this trial has been done among the japanese population who are assigned to rituximab weekly for four doses or in the placebo primary end point were assessed at 24 weeks where there is found there absolute difference of about 8 points in the mrss has been found and they also assigned to the open extension where both the group was given protoxamide in the this is in the initial period and in the uh, in the extension part also here we can see that tosilizumab uh, the rituximab even in the placebo group also started declining and in the rituximab group there is gradually declining in the mrss and in the lung function here we see there is a improvement in the predicted percentage of fbc and also those who is assigned after the placebo also improved this study confirms the efficacy of rituximab in the mrss as well as in the lung next is recycling which was published this month here the rituximab was given in all connective tissue disease including systemic sclerosis idiopathic inflammatory myopathy and mc where rituximab was given in two doses and one gram in two weeks apart uh, or cyclophosphamide the primary end point were rate of change of fbc in ml in 24 weeks here at 24 weeks we can see both the group improved so it's still more favor in case of cyclophosphamide and they follow up up to 48 where also we can see both the groups are improving in lung function and very interestingly in the rituximab group the side effect were adverse effect were much less and exposure to the corticosteroid was much less so treatment with rituximab has a fewer side effect and also we can use less amount of the corticosteroid so rituximab can be considered as an alternative to the cyclophosphamide in the treatment of interstitial lung disease associated with system sclerosis now this is a one of the study which we did in our center in 2016 and 17 here also we compare id cyclophosphamide with the rituximab here the inclusive criteria where we use a very early disease less than 3 years and immunosuppressive need so we found that it is a map is uh, more more uh, in fact improving in the bc compared to the cyclophosphamide possibly this may be because of the ethnic variation or maybe some other uh, reason so uh, after the census there is uh, interest in the combination therapy of immunosuppressive with the anti fiber Uh, in the subset analysis which who are receiving mycophenolet and nentinib they see that patient receiving receiving both has less decline compared to patient receiving only the nentinib so combination may be probably will perform better in case of interstitial lung disease which led to the scleroderma lung disease 3 there there was assumption that combination with will give early response and also will have an additive effect however the power of the study was less because they could not recruit the required number of the patient however the end point in 80 week 18 week 18 months they see that uh, there is no significant difference between the combination and the use of patient but at 6 months there was much earlier response in the combination therapy so possibly still we can we should look whether combination therapy will do better or not so uh, in the pulmonary arterial hypertension agent which we are using is not changed 
But there is a change in the definition of pulmonary arterial hypertension in recent guidelines by European Cardiological as well as Respiratory Society, where the mean pulmonary pressure, which is changed to 20 millimeter, which was earlier 24, and in the pulmonary vascular resistance, which becomes two woods, which was earlier three. And one more, one more uh, approval which they have said is that enhanced triproprostinol would be preferred if the patient of pulmonary arterial hypertension also having co-comedant interstitial lung disease. And digital ulcer is also <coughs> another problem when it is resistant, very difficult to treat with all the available therapies. So, one study I found is very interesting because they will have to have comparison between the botulinum toxin A, which was given two doses in the involved finger in the medial and lateral aspect, and nowadays the alopros and alprostadil, which we are using. So they have looked at the pain as well as the change in the skin color, also in the capillaroscopy. At four weeks, they saw both the groups are moving in the healing of digital ulcer. But the main thing is cost of the botulinum toxin therapy is much, much less than that of the alopros and alprosidine. And especially the hospitalization is not required in case of botulinum toxin. It can be managed in the OPD basis. So lastly, I would like to summarize the new potential target agent because except Romilkiman, which showed the clinical efficacy in, uh, in the declining the skin thickness. Other is in Abatisab, Reosiobat, Rifenidone, Lenibasum, Lenafrabinol, Abatizumab, and even Belumumab could not show any clinically significant improvement in the skin as well as other organs. So, to conclude, Cutaneous based subtyping of systemic sclerosis is inadequate to capture the disease heterogeneity. Preclinical assessment of scleroderma should include specific autoantibody. Nintotinib tocilizumab prevents the annual decline of lung function. Rituximab improves the good lung function all, and also the skin score. Topocetinib may be a novel targeted molecule for the skin as well as in the digital ulcer when it is refractory. Combination of immunosuppressant with antifibrotic could be a better option in case of systemic sclerosis with interstitial lung disease. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's start the question session. Um, and while that's happening, I think we had a wrong, we received a wrong note about Dr. Professor Dunberg earlier on, so that's why we didn't introduce her properly. So I was just asked specifically to mention that, but I think she in her lecture, she herself has uh, mentioned where she's from. Sweden, probably the population of just indoor, okay, but it is famous for so many things like car manufacturing and uh, sweets, chocolate, so many things. They have lots of industries. Yes, and, and of all that, I think the most, since my 25 years ago, my, my MBBS, Karolinska Institute, I've always heard, and they have actually given to the world the best Sorry. research than in more than US, I have to say, because just um, everywhere, US takes the, the credit for everything. But I think Sweden has come up with a lot of good research, and we can see that from her work, what she's done. This completely original work about the pathogenesis. So thanks for coming all the way to Indore, India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, why do you, yeah, I think your question. Thank you. I'm uh, Sapan Pandya. I'm from Ahmedabad, which is the western part of India. Uh, Professor Ingrid, uh, two questions for you. Uh, thank you for two excellent talks. Even your talk, Dr. Sakar, was really very good. Thank you. Uh, the first question is, uh, you said that the, uh, the peptide or the antigen, I'm forgetting the name, which uh, showed uh, in the lung, in the Jovan uh, patients uh, in the bowel fluids. And then we also have evidence of uh, citrullination in rheumatoid arthritis, which probably starts in the lung. What is it in the lung that actually might be starting this kind of antibody generation uh, through antigen exposure? Is the lung microbiome or something? Or, and the second question was regarding the T-cell signatures. 
uh, and you showed me different antibody subsets having different signatures. What about the autoantibody negative subset of myositis? Uh, do you look at the T cell signatures there as well? If we start with the negative subset, then we because we had, we took the consecutive patients where we took a biopsy for diagnostic purpose and it's not always that we have the antibody available at that time. And in, we analyzed 15 biopsies and from seven of them we could extract T cells. And for the remaining we could not extract T cells, so that may have been some seronegative in that group. But, uh, but I would expect that some seronegative would also have T-cells. But we are continuing to collect from more cases to see if there are differences between subgroups. And concerning, is that an answer to your question? Yes. And the first question concerning the lung, I think that's really intriguing. Why we have this, uh, well in my site is up to 70 or 80 percent actually have uh, signs of involvement in the lung with institutional lung disease, which is much higher than in the RA. So it seems to be more prone for this systemic disease that involve, to involve the lung. And, and it's often a first symptom or it may be asymptomatic when the patients come with a muscle weakness. So why? Well, of course, we don't know that, but we know there is uh, smoking, is also a risk factor for at least the do one positive disease. It's a risk factor for RA and other uh, inhalant or pollution factors are risk factors for RA. In my site, we have less data, but we have from the epidemiological studies see from our country seen that if you have had more respiratory infections in your life, you are more likely to have myositis than or rather, if you take myositis patients compared to non-myositis patients, the myositis patients have been hospitalized more with previous respiratory infections. So suggesting that also different types of irritants in like infection, smoking, can activate the immune system in the lung and maybe it's the microbiota that we don't, we don't know that. But I, I would believe that there is a triggering that when you have where your immune system meets the environment and that different factors could change the, maybe the epitopes of the, the, your own protein there do after infection because you have the, with the inflammation, unspecific inflammation. But it's very interesting. We try to understand more. Okay, next question. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. Parashar Ghosh from Calcutta. Uh, my question to Parashar is uh, this is not very excellent, but I am a very simple question. The HLA types are in a populous country like India, all types of HLAs are there. And the innumerable factors which are incriminated in, in myositis or amatomysis, they are also prevalent, all kinds of viruses. And the, uh, they are very prevalent in the environment. So what makes, makes a disease? I'm sorry, I had difficulties to hear. Could you maybe repeat the question? So the, the HLAs are there. Significance of HLA are typing. Yeah. They are there. Environmental agents are also prevalent. Environmental agents, viruses which are incriminated, they are very prevalent in the environment. So which one? Which yeah. how, how does the disease come? I'm not sure. Let, let me help you. He's yeah. saying that there are different HLA types in India. You have a bunch of yeah. HLA types and there are different environmental agents that are incriminated in myositis. So, so how do you link up these two and which of these is probably more significant. I think that's what he wants, he wants to ask. Yes, I show we have several different HLA types associated with myositis in, uh, this was in European, uh, people with European ancestry. And they're different, I know, in Asia and okay. India. So I guess we need to understand the interaction between the environment and the HLA and thereby to understand we need to have large cohorts and where they are well defined and in autoantibody clinics and where we can do the HLA typing and to understand the role. We are not there yet. So myself Deepa Gautam from IMSBHO and see my question is to Dr. Gita Vrishtar who has presented a very enlightening lecture. 
still I have a question ma'am. Uh, we came across a female in her third decade who didn't, who was not, who was not, who has not completed her family till that time. And she was diagnosed with limited variety of scleroderma. In the light of these three drugs which are found to be uh, most effective, Lucidizumab, Rutixumab and this third one. So what is your recommendation about whether she should be, uh, I mean when she should be allowed to conceive and what will be the management uh, during pregnancy? First of all, I just want to know the age of the patient. She was 29 years. She is 29. Although it's rare in that age, but she had uh, it. Like in case of limited systemic sclerosis, is she having interstitial lung disease, you want to say? No, no, no. She was only anti syndromic positive along with the criteria diagnosing her to be limited variety of sclerosis. Yes. First of all, like disease of classifying does not uh, give us importance of the predilection of the organ. So, first of all, we need to see any other antibody, only the anti-centromia that she may have a vascular phenomenon more frequent. If she is not having currently lung disease or any other in the form of like uh, cardiac disease. She had Renault's phenomena also. Renault phenomena. So, we should look the vasculopathy is there or not with using the nerve capillaroscopy and if she is already fulfilled the criteria of systemic sclerosis, we should look for the organ involved. If there is no organ involvement, we don't need to give all that. Once if there is a suggestion of involvement of any organ, then only we should look for whether which molecule we need to give. Is okay, so no treatment required in pregnancy? No, not at all. If she is having arthritis, you can give some uh, medicines. Otherwise, uh, if she is having only not and uh, you know, uh, this time, uh, positive, we don't need to do anything. Can, can we give nephritipine locally? Yes, that is for the Renox. For the treatment of Renox, you can give uh, calcium sinus blocker or even endothelial uh, receptor. Uh, that even you can try. Thank you. I have one last question for Professor Rumber. Just this myositis, uh, it was described only in the middle of 19th century, so just last 150s. So do you really believe it's a modern disease? Or it's an old disease? Oh, that's a very difficult question because I'm not aware of any like uh, <coughs> presentation of individuals from the literature or uh, or from. Uh, then what's a guess with your from expertise? From, uh, yeah. from paintings or from. Yeah, so uh, I would, as it's so striking, uh, particularly when you have the dermatomyositis. I would guess it's a more modern disease and that would maybe then speak for some of the more of the environmental factors that have increased. But also there is the link to cancer. And so I, I don't know if if you have cancer and that is taking away people very early before, maybe they did not even have the skin rash. I don't know. But Thank I you. would propose it's a more modern, modern disease. disease. Thank you very much. Thank you. For what time we will close the session. Thank you. Thank you. We now have the last session for the day. I thank Dr. Pradeep Kumar, Dr. Nadu Rajmundran for chairing the session, and Dr. Uh, Professor Ingrid and Dr. Geeta Sri Sarkar for our talk. May I request Dr. Bhamki Desai sir and Dr. Sajan Chanai to chair the next session. Dr. Pankit Desai is a senior rheumatologist from Surat. He is a past president of Gujarat Rheumatology Association. Dr. Sajan Chanai is consultant rheumatologist and rheumatologist, Department of Clinical Immunology and Rheumatology, JNC Hospital, Mangalore. Over to you, sir. Good evening, friends. See so much crowding the audience. And, uh, after the absorbing uh, advances in rheumatology, uh, this last session is going to be equally absorbing. And we have uh, next speaker, Dr. Parashar Ghosh. Please come on the stage. Dr. Ghosh is a uh, uh, clinical immunologist and rheumatologist. He gives SGPI in Lucknow. And everybody has seen that uh, steroid free remission in rheumatic diseases is really true. Dr. Ghosh is Steroid-free revision in autoimmune rheumatic diseases nearly wide. So as we go through the presentation, we learn that uh, it's, it's, it's possible, but it may be 
درس ہم یوں ڈسٹرکٹ یونیورسٹی میں اور انڈین سٹی میں تو ایسا ٹاک اباؤٹ لٹل بٹ آف دی ہسٹری آف اسٹیرائڈ دین اس یوز آف اسٹیرائڈ ٹو ریوماٹائڈ آرتھرائٹس لوپاش اینڈ ہاسکولائٹس ایسا ٹاک اباؤٹ دین ون آف ون آف پرائنر دیر بٹ وچ ڈال سو دیٹ دیر آر سرٹن ڈیزیزز پرٹی اون ڈیزیزز ریوماٹائڈ ڈیزیزز وچ آر بیسیکلی کیوریبل ڈیزیزز لائک چائلڈ ہاسکولائٹس ایچ ایس پی اینڈ کاوس ایکی دیر دیر بیسیکلی موسٹ آف دی ٹائم دیر دیر کیوریبل There are certain diseases like childhood dermatomyositis. In one third of the patients, they are again curable. They have a monocyclic disease. Similarly, classic plan in two thirds. It is a monocyclic disease. So they have drug-free remission. Now I thought that this, this story of steroids might be of interest to you. And you know that in 1948, Mrs. G was the first patient who was treated with cortisol by Dr. Philip Hinch. He was the rheumatologist. In 1950, Dr. Philip Hinch, along with his colleague, Kendall, who is a chemist and other Polish colleague, this time they got the Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology. So it seems like a very dream journey. They got the Nobel Prize. But the actual process started long back in April 1929 when Hinch observed that a doctor, 65 year old doctor, experienced relief from his inflammatory arthritis with onset of jaundice. And that patient lasted for months. So this was his attitude observation. And then in another profile, we had collected. 37 patients. And then he embarked on a trial of lactopenin, which is used to induce jaundice. And this, and in the month of July 1948, two patients, two patients were referred for study. And one of them responded, and Mr. Mrs. G did not respond. And she wanted to have relief, and she was the first patient who was given this injection of condition, September 21st, 1948. And this is the history. But the reality was that Mrs. G, within a month, became grossly dissimilated as she had psychosis. So much so that she required transfer to a large psychiatric facility and condition was tapered off. But disenchanted with condition, she never visited Rio and she never took condition. Even her reality was that the, this is the publication from the Rio and based on this, the Rio Prize was awarded. But by 1950, it was clear, becoming clear that steroid has many side effects. So everybody, everybody started questioning why the prize was given so early, in a hurry, in a two years, from the discovery to the Nobel Prize, only two years. But you know now that it was a wrong, wrong, wrong allegation. Coming back to the steroids in human trial, it's the reality, we know all that. But it was the best trial, it was published in 2005, in Arthritis Humanism, it has four on. <coughs> and then in 2011, in the Alonso Rheumatic Disease, we had the five-year follow-up. And we find that, by five years, 23% patients had drug free remission. Though those are the last four months, three years. But so in rheumatoid, we can have drug free remission. That, that is a reality there in rheumatoid. In addition, regular update for the management of rheumatoid, look at the number six, six point. Short term glucocorticoid should be, should be considered when resetting or changing demands. And this short term is three months, less than three months they have said. And based on this concept was this trial, for our trial. But they have given steroids for three months only, and then they stop. If you read the trial, in the results section you will find it, most of the patients require the introduction of steroids. And if you look, the, look at the editorial of the Brosen in this, in this issue, it says that three months of glucocorticoids in rheumatoid every is too short. So what I impress upon is that, even if the recommendation says less than three months of this steroids, but most of the patients will be required more than that. That is what you want to do. In the 1940s, after rheumatoid, success in rheumatoid, steroid was tried in lupus. And you all know that many of the patients have in the long-term cohort, ACL cohort, which are from the West, 88% of the patients are around steroids. And as many as 57 to 86 percent this is continuous treatment on steroids. This is Western patient. People, patients in the West who are, seems who are having mind like disease as compared to us. In London and lupus, steroid free remission, even drug free remission is not uncommon. This is a psychiatric lupus or hematological lupus. But in lupus nephritis, steroids, tapering steroids completely or is, is very much controversial, as we shall see now. But this is the current, the current the standard of care. We treat the patient with oral prednisolone or pass with that prednisolone and then either cyclophosphamide or mycopenolate. This was the trial in 2004, back in 2004. So, it is all given aricyclophosphamide or cyclophosphamide, then they were maintained on aricyclophosphamide and low dose penicillin. And look at the results. Followed by 12 
24 and 36 months. By 36 months, or 3 years, almost half of the patient has to live. This is the reality, was the reality at the time, which Hangla was met followed by Jaya Sarkin and Lodo's condition. But even then, also, in 2006, people have tried tapering of not only style, but also other things of the person. So in this style, 32 patients with polyphatic lupus nephritis in remission, the immunosuppressant was tapered out. And we see that about 50% of the patient they, they relapsed. And what they find was that the variables which are significantly different between the groups who relapsed and who did not relapse, patients who did not relapse, they have more months of therapy, 57 months almost, five years of therapy with steroids, and also they are in remission for 24 months. That was the difference between the groups. This famous Itaxilab study. In this study, patients are given Itaxilab all over the microphone. They know oral steroids. And this study caused a lot of hype. And if you look at the result at the, at the end of six months, about 90% patients had renal response. And 72% patients were in complete remission. So it was a lot, lot of enthusiasm. But if you look at the relapse, you see that the relapse is yet is also increasing. And this study, was supposed to be followed by a large multi center international study and it was supposed to be completed, the enrollment was supposed to be completed by 2017. 24 watt patients was supposed to be included. Included, only 34 could be included by that time and the study never took place. So we had, we had disappointment with rejection of and without steroid in lupus nephritis especially. Now in this trial, the recent trial in 2018, the patients are given. Uh, Cyclosomide then maintained on microfluidics. It's a study. And then when the patient was in remission for 12 months, then the, the immunosuppression was stopped and the kidney was stopped. And they looked at the patient. They found that 36% had relapsed. Of them, uh, of, of the 36% patients, 11 had relapsed. And of the 11 patients, they had lupus hepatitis activity more than 2. So what they concluded is that we can do kidney biopsy. If the kidney biopsy is suggested, if the histological imagery is there, then you can probably taper off the immune suppression, not only steroids. At this study, we looked at the flare rate and factors determining the flare occurrence in patients with lupus who achieve low disease activity or remission. In this trial, they have found that if the, if the patient is a low dose steroid, be it 2.5 mg or 5 mg or 7.5 mg, it doesn't matter, the, the renal flare does not differ. But if the patient is off steroid, on the left hand side of the graph, if the is off steroid, then this is the solid line if the patient is off steroid and this is the broken line is if it is on some dose of steroid. So there is a difference in the relapse. So if it was off, off steroid, relapse is much more, significantly more. So there are controversies are there. And this is a recently published study. In this study they looked at one of the factors who predicted who are going to relapse. And they found that Patients who are in oral immunosuppression for more than three years and who are on ACQ, on our hydroxychloroquine, they are less likely to relapse. To, to, to summarize, in non-renal -non lupus, steroid free remission as well as dark free remission is quite common. But in renal lupus, steroid will be withdrawn if the patient is in remission for say about three years, that you can, you can say. And if we can do kidney biopsy, if the patient is in histological remission, then probably you can cover off steroids. And the reality of setting might be different. Lodo story is, is continued independently with most of the centers in, across India. And there is a, a perspective cohort by, by, headed by Dr. Amita Agarwal, inspired cohort, which is running for the last three, four years. And if you look at the patient, it's the referee's patient, all are getting steroids. And the rationale is that Indian patients, we were having aggressive kind of lupus as compared to the lupus in the West. And this is a study from our center. We looked at the data of 128 patients in whom steroid was, was stopped. And we find that about 20 percent patients in whom steroid was stopped, they had, they, they, they had relapsed and mostly relapsed, they relapsed within the first year. And th those who did not relapse, they had this steroid therapy for more than 8 years before discontinuation and they were on additional anti immunosuppressive measures. And the another finding was that immunosuppressive psychiatric lupus is unlikely to relapse once in division. So this was our, a good finding there. Now coming to vasculitis, it was being used in 1950 onwards and the survival increased from less than 15% to 48%. In 1971, Sarkovasmak was used in a patient with GPA and in 2010 we have Detaximab and in 2017 we have, we have Avagopan. 
With detection, we have, we have, we, we, we came to know that we can use reduced dose of particular steroid, and with the focus one, we can be probably treat a or induce the remission in a anti-acidic hospitalities without particular steroids. These are the number of regimens which are available for inducing remission in patients with anti-acidic vasculitis. And these two slides, I think 15, 15 such uh, regimens are there. I have been researching about the rape trial, which compares detection of versus cyclophosphamide. And after six months, steroid was actually stopped if the patients have been remission. I have also discussed the flexible trial, which says that reduced dose, are these reduced dose glucocorticoids? So reduced dose glucocorticoids, and this is the standard dose. Glucocorticoids, they are actually similar, typically similar. And after also discussed about the advocate trial, which said, Abacabon, with Abacabon we can have the, mm -hmm. the steroid free remission. Coming to the rape trial, and in this trial, this patients are given vitaxima basically oral cycle comparison and steroid was stopped at 6 months with the patient was in remission. <coughs> and if we look at the results, they are, they are, they are, they are equally good. And for the 18 months follow up, after steroid was stopped in many of the patients when they were in remission, we find that at 12 months, a 47 patient uh, was in remission. 6 months it was 63, then become 47, 18 months become 39. So patients are relapsing. So when the patients are off steroid, the disease comes back. And this is the famous flexible trial. It included only severe anti-acidic vasculitis patients, patients who had uh, agitemia with EGFR less than 50, and patients who had pulmonary capillaritis, they were given cyclophosphamide. And then they were given other class of stain, there were no plasma stain, then standard dose or reduced dose of steroids. And if you were about the standard dose and reduced dose of steroids, basically uh, all were given one of the conditions for one to three days, then standard dose group they receive one milligram per kg and reduced dose receive one five milligram per kg. But by at the end of six months they are all on five milligram per day. And this is the result. So days from any cause or not from any stage in the disease was similar. So be that either problem exchange or problem exchange, either high dose or standard dose group modified or low dose group or reduced dose group modified. So it says that we can treat patients or severe patients with anti-acidic vasculitis with reduced dose group modified. Now come ABAC1. So it's a molecule which, 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 which is a, it's, it's a uh, it's, it's, it's against the receptor C5A receptor, so it binds to the C5A receptor and even binding of C5A to it. So there are two meeting acid of C5A. And what C5A causes? It causes complement, neutral chemotaxis and neutral activation. That is preventive. The few words about the role of the, uh, the, the C5A, basically, some kind of inflammatory stimulus trigger like in rectal infection of the ear, nose, and throat can cause release of certain cytokines like TNF alpha which causes neutrophil primary and neutrophil chemotaxis and it will get activated and activated neutrophil with particular endothelium, ligas, rosh, platic enzymes, damages the endothelium. It also throws nets and thereby the neutrophil generates its contents. Like here, the neutrophil comes in contact with the immune system and the immune system gets activated, complement gets activated, it's an alternate complement system, C5A, and the loop goes on like this. So this trial, clear trial was the proof of this concept and in this trial, Patients are given, all patients are given standard therapy, either cyclophosphamide or ituxima, and then in the control group, they receive standard dose steroid. And in the study group, they receive abacopan, plus reduced dose steroid, or only abacopan. And what they found is that in the abacopan group, with or without steroid, or abacopan alone or abacopan with low dose steroid, they did better. So this trial gives the hope that with C5 receptor inhibition, uh, was effective in replacing high dose glucocorticoids in the treating vasculitis. The so classic trial was again, again a phase 2 trial, I will not discuss that, but I also discuss about the advocate trial, which is a phase 3 trial, large multi center trial, and in this trial, oral alcohol was compared with oral penicillin, and all patients received cyclophosphamide, then azathioprine, or reduction. So that was the standard of therapy that all patients received, and the end point was, first one was the remission at 26 weeks and second one was sustained remission. So it was defined by remission at both, both week 26 and 52. And it was treated for both for inferiority as, as well as the superiority. And what the point was that at 26 weeks, Abacapon 72.3% remission and Prednisolone 71.1% and 
if it was included, if you look at the impurity, then it is three to three million. And at week 52, if you look at substance emission, it was 65.7% and 54.9%. Even superiority was significant. And the side effects were comparable in both the groups. So it, con it concluded that avocabon versus consistent upper group. The avocabon was non inferior but not superior at individual emission at week 26. And Aragabun was superior as compared to Benzone Tapal in, in, in illusion sustained revision at week 52. So with Aragabun we can induce revision in patients without, without using particular steroids. And this is a trial which was presented this year in this year one gene. So this is a, this antibody, anti 3 5 antibody. Uh, the name is Milovelimab. And this molecule, with this molecule also the results are similar. And it shows that with Bilimumab alone or with standard treatment, standard of care or Bilimumab, we load up with or reduce one with glucocorticoid. Basically, the, the result is already similar. They have good results. And it says that Bilimumab may have the potential to reduce the use of particular steroid. We can use broad dose of steroid or may not use the steroid, still you can get the same kind of result. And this is the Tosilumab in Janssen arthritis. And it says that with Tosilumab, with the patient case, if you are alternatively with Tosilumab, the patient can be off corticosteroid. And even if Takayashu, whatever literature available, it says that if we stop corticosteroid, this is come back. So in Takayashu problem, we cannot, we cannot be off steroid. The patient cannot be off corticosteroid. And the reality in anti-acidic hospital is this that all patients who is organ threatening anti-acidic hospital are on low dose corticosteroid. Say about family ground per day. Whosoever treats the patient in the across this country, all are getting corticosteroid. And abacabin is very, very costly. This is not a reality in our country. Till now, when the when the patent patent will expire, they will be very Thank you, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. From uh, the PGI, PGI Mar Chandigarh. She is a professor of pediatric allergy and immunology in the advanced pediatric center. So we are not so much oriented towards such disorders. But then over the last few years when we have heard about deficiency of adenosine DRNSs, the CVIDs, the various other inborn errors which we are now coming across more and more, it is very important that we get uh, ourselves oriented towards these kind of inborn errors and uh, that's why we have uh, this topic. So I hand over the mic to Dr. Deepthi. Thank you Chairperson. Thank you uh, the organizers and Dr. Ganga for this opportunity. And I must, before I start, tell you about my conversation with Dr. Dr. on telephone. So, Deepthi, we want you to talk on human inborn errors of immunity, but restrict yourself to the rheumatologists. Also, restrict yourself to the adult physicians. And uh, it's an advanced course, so please talk only about the advances. So, with those three big riders, adult rheumatologists and advances, I today start my presentation and I, I don't know how much I succeed keeping myself restricted to these three. So my outline is going to be the introduction, the genetic concepts, some illustrative cases and in the end I have prepared a quiz on autoinflammatory disorders. If time permits, I will the chairperson's permit, we take cross that. So human immune errors of immunity were better known as primary immune deficiency diseases. And this is one of the most important slides which keeps changing every year because these disorders are being increasingly recognized and today encompass 485 different uh, gen genes which are involved in causation of the inborn errors of immunity. These are being increasingly recognized. However, the basis remains the same that they are caused by the damaging germline variants, damaging germline variants so what are some recent concepts in genetics? We all know that mutations are inherited. However, many mutations are also de novo mutations. That means the parents are not the germline carriers and hence family history is not contributory. This is the, the lower graph here tells you about the mutation occurring de novo in, in the zygote resulting in a phenotype resulting in a uh, phenotype at a later date. However, what is also important is the fact that one has to be aware of a concept called mosaicism. Now, what is mosaicism? Mosaicism is when mutation occurred post-zygotically, two or more
four cell populations with different genotypes coexist within the same organism. That means you may have certain cells with the mutation, certain cells without the mutations. And now there are different types of mosaics, somatic, gonadal and gonosomatic mosaics. So this is important here that mosaics can be gonadic, gonadic mosaic, somatic mosaics and it is important that you understand the concept of somatic mosaics because this is the most important concept for a IEI to present in adulthood. So the germline mutations can present in adulthood if they are hypomorphic, that means if they are given the sense mutation, that is point mutations, or even if they are deleterious mutations like a splice site mutation, but they are leaky, they still have some protein formation and the most important example would be an XLA presents late because he still has some residual BTK expression. Somatic mutations are the ones which result in somatic mosaicism and it is likelihood that somatic mosaicism increases with age and this is, can result in an adult onset presentation itself in, 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 in cooperation or in cooperation with an inherited germline mutation. And this is an important concept that one has to understand because most auto-inflammatory disorders would have somatic, somatic mosaicism and if you do a routine genetic sequencing, you will not find the mutation. These mosaics can appear in different cellular compartments. That means, for example, a FAS ligand to ALPS, a loss of function FAS mutation occurring only in double negative B cells will result in the disease manifestation why, if you look at the germline uh, mutation in other cells, that you may not find this mutation. Regular mutations, these are the mutations which also occur. That means the second mutation occurs, which brings the uh, protein back in frame and thereby providing a survival advantage. So, a, a deleterious mutation, but a germline, but a somatic mutation which occurs, which brings the patient back, which brings the uh, uh, the sequence back into frame resulting in protein expression. There is also a concept of epistaxis. Epistasis that means two mutations can correlate and have an effect over one another. Say for example one mutation in an interferon pathway along with another mutation and the effect of both the mutations can result in what is called as epistasis. So this is how a very important table for everyone to read and this is how an adult onset monogenic disorder can present with hypomorphic mutations, the somatic mutations but in addition you also have the environmental and epigenetic influences. With that little bit of background on genetics, let's move to certain case scenarios and these inborn errors of immunity are classified into 10 different types. And I'll take across some of them, it's not possible in the next 20 minutes to give you illustrative examples of each. But you can see from this diagram here that this, these patients present well beyond uh, adolescence and right up to the age of 90 years and uh, right up to the age of 90 years and in different categories. So defects affecting the first step is the defects affecting the cellular and humoral immunity. These are not difficult to recognize because these patients are also have recurrent cytopulmonary infections. They can be identified by looking at serum IgE levels and the flow cytometry for abnormal T cell or B cell function. The predominant antibody deficiencies with adult onset. And in, in this point, you have the common immune variable disease. And in the, the diagram in the end shows that C, CVID can present with autoimmunity, ITP, neutropenias, chronic lung disease, and a lot of granulomas and cancers. So this is a varied manifestation of common immune variable disease. And how do we end up investigating these patients is by doing serum immunoglobulins, looking at the functional antibodies for the vaccine responses and in the end a very important test that is isotype switched memory B cells. This is CD27 positive cells and these low isotype uh, memory cells are significantly associated with autoimmunity, granulomas, hyperstrenism, 
lymphoid hyperplasia and chronic lung disease. Now this was a 19 year old boy, he was referred from dermatology to us thinking that this child has a, a erysipelas like rash but it was really reasonably booty. Over a period of time by evaluating it, it burst and became a pyoderma ganglionose of patients. On examination the child had normal blood counts but there was thrombocytopenia. We did a serum immunoglobulin in this patient, he was found to have A gamma globulinemia, absent B cells. An uh, important clue was coming from the history, the child had lost the previous sibling. He also gave history of recurrent hospitalizations, receiving IV antibiotics. A targeted sequencing was performed and it was found to have a mutation in CD749A. 79, we were thinking that this patient would have an XLA or a BTK mutation. However, this patient turned out to have what is called as uh, Ig uh, deficiency in Ig immunoglobulin alpha chain and if you can see here, you can see that this is the alpha chain which is important for development of pro-B2, pre-B cells. This is a very rare disorder, very commonly described for uh, as a A or A gamma globulinemia and you can see varied other genes that are responsible for A, A gamma globulinemia in autosomal recessive forms. But what about the skin lesions? So these skin lesions actually are because of Helicobacter pylori infection and this Helicobacter pylori has been linked with eosinophilic fasciitis for long and this is because children with A gamma globulinemia are unable to handle H pylori infection and this is a signature organism and in order to identify one has to do a 16S RNA gene sequencing and the treatment you can see is approximately 12 months of etropenum, azithromycin and oral levoproxacine. The child was advised a biopsy, we performed the multiplex PCR, helicobacter fetus was identified and the child was treated with ejectable therapies. We have seen this kind of woody lesions in patients with XLA who are on regular IVIG therapy before and on treatment this is how it clears off. Moving on to the next sector that is diseases with immune dysregulation and in this you have four important components the familial HLH and autoimmunity with or without lipoproliferation and I will be dealing only with these two today. This was a 15 year old boy who was referred to us for query lupus, query lymphoma, fever for 10 months, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, pleural effusions had developed progressive paraparesis, proteinuria and seizures at a command hospital uh, at Chandri Mandir. She, he was then referred to us for considering the possibility of lupus or lymphoma and what you can see is that he had cytopenias with a ferritin elevated. The nerve conduction showed CIDP while the kidney biopsy showed a lot of uh, histiocytes and the bone marrow showed granulomas with hemophagocytosis. So he had some component of CVID while some component of HLA. So CVID with HLA phenotype, uh, what is most likely was a STK BP2 mutation. And this patient, these patients, this particular protein is needed for the docking and trimming in the degranulation. And as this is just to highlight the fact that late onset HLH can be seen in patients, adult patients who have permanent deficiency syntaxin 11 deficiency and as well as MUNC 18 or 2 deficiency which is also called as the STKDP2 deficiency. These patients have varied phenotype including granulomas, sensory neural hearing loss as well as hypogamma. The only test that is important is low CD107A expression or what is called as the granule release assay. Serum immunoglobulins and granular release assay can help you identify patients with HLH. We move on to the next category, autoimmunity with or without lymphoproliferation. And I can't go about without mentioning the T regulatory cells and the important genes that are involved in generation as well as suppression and maintenance of T, regu T regulatory cells and in which I talk about uh, the most important gene that is the AF gene. So this was a 10 year old boy who had had repeated episodes of hypocalcemia and was referred to PGI. On examination he had these kind of oral ulcers and a closed look 
at the nails helped us with the diagnosis. He had onychomycosis and oral candidiasis along with hypocalcemia. So that kind of fits into the diagnosis and when we looked in further he had hypoparathyroidism, anti-TPO antibodies and the diagnosis of epicent was made. Autoimmune polyendocrinopathy, candidiasis, ectodermal dystrophy, which is because of the uh, problems or mutations in the AIR gene, which is important to, uh, for the tolerance. So, uh, these patients can present at a later date with Addison's disease, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, and a lot of endocrinopathies. And the reason why they develop a lot of autoantibodies is the fact that uh, they develop, uh, because of this uh, loss of tolerance, they will have a lot of autoantibodies against most of the diseases. Why do they have candidial infection? They, because they develop autoantibodies against IL-12 and IL-22. So this is another child who was referred for suspected lupus with APLA positivity. Look at the vasculitic ulcers. But what helped the diagnosis was a urine test for looking at urinary proline and this patient had a prolidase deficiency. Again, a refractory leg ulcers can happen in patients with prolidase deficiency and this is classified. This important disease has an adult presentation with and without lymphoproliferation and they have a lot of autoimmunity. Prolidase is an important enzyme which is important for collagen metabolism as well as matrix remodeling. We had seen such patients before. This is a non-healing ulcer on the foot and they also have a typical phenotype in the form of little bit of facial abnormalities. A 20 year old child whom we have been following as a, uh, CNS lupus had actually come with medium, uh, had uh, had was rethought of in the clinic because we thought that her DS DNA continued to be negative all throughout. So we thought it is a data too, but what it actually turned out to be on genetic sequencing was a G6PD mutation. And this is a girl child with G6PD mutation and uh, homozygous in nature. And if you and I said, should we should I just this disregard this mutation. But when I read up, I realized that G6PD is an important ROS, uh, ROS enzyme and this results in oxidative stress which is an important causal factor for autoimmune hemolytic anemia and has been nowadays implicated in pathogenesis of lupus and there are multiple papers on looking at reactive oxygen species in patients with lupus. So this is how it can cause immune exacerbation. Thank you. So, and this exact com com uh, concept is also important in patients with CGD. Uh, and you all know that carriers of patients with chronic granulomatous disease have autoimmunity and they can develop lupus. So a mother of a CGD child can develop, X-linked carriers can develop autoimmunity in the form of SLE. Lastly, we follow a large cohort of patients with Biscott Audit Syndrome and this child with Biscott Audit Syndrome came to us at 10 years of age with abdominal mass. And look at the uh, CT angiography. This was a palpable mass and you can see the large vessel vasculitis that can be seen in patients with Biscott Audit Syndrome even having thrombosis. So with with thrombocytopenia and a lot of thrombosis, this patient was a difficult child to manage. We lost him ultimately because of ruptured necks after two years. However, um, this kind of large vessel vasculitis is very well described in patients with this hot orbit syndrome. Uh, and you can uh, you can understand the reason why I am saying this is because of the fact that. She, Many patients with Biscott have a minor phenotype which is called an X-linked thrombocytopenia and should all patients with X-linked thrombocytopenia be screened for large vessel vasculopathy which is still not clear. Do I have time sir to just go for... This is a quiz on autoinflammatory syndromes that I have prepared. I'll just show a pictorial graph. Nine, year old, nine years old, if you 
can answer it's okay otherwise i'll follow go ahead this is a child with lot of arthritis and interstitial lung disease father also has lot of arthritis and interstitial lung disease any diagnosis copa yeah that's it so this is copa syndrome and copa syndrome has patients with copa have early onset inflammatory arthritis strong family history evidence of lung involvement elevated esrs elevated re factor positivity hypergammaglobulinemia and ana positivity so if you have interstitial lung disease with re factor positivity as well as ana positivity think and or genetics in between think of uh, copa syndrome recurrent fevers bechet like phenotype oral genital ulcers she also had arthritis so haploinsufficiency of age 20 is the auto inflammatory disease and this child had a mutation in tnfia p3 and if you can see then then after we uh, found the child we sequence the mother and the mother is also the carrier for the same gene uh, currently not having uh, the bechet phenotype but she has pancreatitis so another important manifestation of autoimmune autoimmune granulomatous uveitis in both uh, father and son and and the son has this kind of bogi synovitis arthritis and camptodactyly below no. syndrome so uh, an important uh, concept that we found on following up patients with blau syndrome is that most of the patient had a single gene variant and that is r33w in exon 4a so this particular variant can be very easily tested in patients with granulomatous uveitis and it can really change the direction of treatment that you manage the patients with we all can also look at flu cytometry of nor2 expression and you can see that this is in control by in patients we can see low uh, not to expression and this serves as a very simple and a reliable test to identify patients with not to so uh, another heat map showing extremely uh, inflamed in extreme inflammation in patients with blau syndrome two families hodgkin's disease pure red cell plasia asymptomatic by some patients are asymptomatic <coughs> on the other hand is polyarthritis nodosa and uh, central retinal artery occlusion diagnosis any unifying diagnosis so this is dada 2 so dada 2 can have pan like presentation as well as a pure hematological presentation in the form of pure red cell aplasia or hodgkin's lymphoma after recognizing some patients with dada 2 i feel this is an important presentation and lipidoid rash without anything can be a very important clue of dada 2 this is a child with fevers for 6 months raised esr crp and look at the rash again dada 2 so lipidoid rash is a very important clue of dada 2 lastly anybody for for this these kind of epiphyseal overgrowths look at this the, the x rays so this is nomad for caps and this kind of epiphyseal destruction can occur in patients with nomad or caps and they can have in addition they can have sensory neural hearing loss fevers as well as a uh, lot of rash with very early in in life father and child periorbital puffiness so this is crash so periodic fevers with inflammation another child trap another elderly lady with this kind of neutrophilic dermatosis who had traps and lastly is something that you are going to hear a lot about in the next two days and the vexa syndrome this is because of a hypomorphic mutation i hope you understand the meanings now and this is a somatic hypomorphic mutation in uva1 gene which results in vexa syndrome which is identified to be a most important cause of relapsing polychondritis 
as well as bone marrow failure and lot of uh, uh, lot of vascular vasculopathy. So autoinflammatory syndromes. We see a lot of autoinflammatory syndromes. But uh, I'll just end by last my last slide, which says that treatment has always been elusive. But nowadays we have the national policy for rare diseases, which in, which will soon help these patients in treatment. If, especially 50 lakhs has been directed to every child who has a rare disease. So I hope in the end I I can just wind up by saying that when we hear the hooves beat, one thinks of horses. However, one must think of zebras also. And IEIs as well as autoinflammatory diseases are the zebras of uh, clinical, uh, clinical uh, practice. Thank you.